and give me a new set of gloves. <clears throat> I think the mic is okay for you guys, but you have to let me know. Can you hear Raquel? Can, can you, you say something? Can you hear okay now? Yep, okay, good. thank you. Great. And I, <clears throat> if this needs to be moved or whatever, I can do it. Okay. So, but I, I brought it onto the outside. Perfect. So. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's Is, uh, are we ready? Whenever you are. Can I talk? Um, I'm ready. Just keep, well, I, 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 just, I need to know if, if I'm we're gonna up. just move along here, so. Stair strips? Mm -hmm. Hey, um, Do you have the doctor's mic up? Yes. yes. All righty. Is the stream up? Tape. Someone? Have you Hi, everybody, this. if we are. All right, hold this up here. Short needle local on a tape. Uh, sure. Oh, it fell off. Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, no. It's I'm here. Hello, one two one two one two. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Hello. I'm right here. I'll... What's that? Yes. Okay, we're Are we streaming? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Senior Health Correspondent Monica Robbins with WKYC. We are streaming a live surgery here at Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery. Dr. Michael Witnowski is our surgeon working on uh, Dr. Gloria Roman. Dr. Witnowski, can you tell us what you're gonna be doing? Sure, uh, what we're gonna do today is a lower cheek and a neck lift. Very, very common procedure. And uh, uh, my hope is to kind of educate everybody and let them know and demystify this procedure. Um, however, I wanna emphasize that these are real surgeries. And they need to be done by properly trained people, board certified plastic surgeons and they need to be done in accredited facilities like we have here. Uh, and uh, they're procedures that need to not be taken lightly. Um, sometimes you hear the nip and tuck term on TV and uh, kind of making light of all these sorts of things. But properly done, face and neck lifting is a wonderful procedure and gives nice, wonderful results to improve areas of cosmetic problems. Uh, Gloria's problem, the main problem, is that she has some laxity in the cheek and the neck especially in what we call the front of the neck, which is where I am right now. And uh, that's due to a little bit of loose skin. There's some excess fatty tissue in that area, which we're gonna lipo contour. And then there's some little loose neck muscles, so-called turkey gobble muscles, which we're gonna tighten. All that's done through the incision under the chin. And then once we fix that part, then we're gonna go to the left side of the face and then the right side of the face to tailor the laxity in the cheek and the jowl and the, the uh, outer neck area off to the side here, off to the side here. And you can see when I'm touching her how much lax tissue she has. And our job is to tailor that tissue and put it where it belongs. Um, <clears throat> facelifting is very much like making a bed. When you make a bed, you have a bedspread, a blanket, and a sheet. And the face is the same way. The face has skin, fat, and muscle. So when we do a facelift, we correct all three of those layers. The skin on the outside is like the bedspread, and then the muscle and the fat are like the blanket and the sheet. Correcting all of those layers allows us to make an effective change in terms of uh, contour improvement, but most importantly, a natural change. So how long is this going to take approximately? Uh, these procedures take somewhere between three to four hours, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Um, when you're doing a surgery like this, the limiting factor has to do with the amount of surgical bleeding you have. There's never dangerous bleeding, not life-threatening bleeding or anything like that, but the face is a very vascular structure, so there's a lot of blood vessels in the face. So one of the things that we have to control during the whole procedure is the amount of bleeding a patient is having as we're going along through the trip of the facelift. And that can take time, or sometimes there's a minimal amount of bleeding, and we clip along a little faster. So um, you'll see me injecting. I'm injecting a solution, and that solution has um, two, 
substances in it. One is a little local anesthesia, which allows for some post-operative pain relief and also allows anesthesia to use less medication during the procedure, so it supplements the anesthesia. But the most important solution is called epinephrine. <clears throat> epinephrine is a blood vessel constrictor, and that, when I inject it in the areas that we're going to operate, constricts the blood vessels, so there's usually a minimal amount of bleeding during the procedure. Mark and Penn. So we have a lot of uh, questions that we're going to be answering, your live questions. If you have any, please go to our WKYC Facebook page. You can ask them on that. You can also ask them on my Twitter. You can tweet me at Monica Robbins, or you can go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC. I have uh, pinned tweets and pin, a pinned story at the top. You can comment on those. I will be getting to uh, viewer questions throughout this, but uh, we're going to stay on the surgery. We have two cameras going. This camera is going to be monitoring what the doctor is doing from this side, more like a wide shot. And then we have a camera directly on our Change patient. Size. And uh, I, you know, I want to mm -hmm. warn people, there is some viewer discretion. You are going to see a surgery from start to finish. So be aware, that's why we're doing this on WKYC.com. You have the choice to click to decide whether or Over. not you want to watch. And again, we're going to be uh, <clears throat> answering your we'll questions throughout the next three to four hours during this procedure. So if you have any, feel free to, uh, to ask away. And Doc, one of the questions that uh, we had was, you know, what's the difference between this and say the, the fillers or the Botox? Well, you know, the um, fillers and Botox are stop gaps. Uh, they are procedures that can improve localized areas of concern and uh, uh, give people a temporary improvement in certain areas. Fillers, frown lines, squint lines around the eyes. Uh, excuse me, Botox, frown lines, and squint lines around the eyes. And then the lower part of the face, we use filler to fill the folds around the mouth and the uh, wrinkles around the lips and so forth. The difference between fillers and surgery is that fillers are temporary, six months to a year, Botox about three to four months, and surgery is very long term. Results of surgery to some degree, patients have a very long term benefit from the procedure, meaning once they've had an area rejuvenated, they will forever and always look better than they would have had they never had that area rejuvenating. <clears throat> but you know, grass grows, aging continues, so there's some slow gradual undoing, but uh, patients, once they've had a rejuvenation surgical procedure, will forever and always look better than they would have had they never had it done, even though aging continues. How long does this last? Well, um, kind of as I just mentioned, to some degree there's a long last, uh, meaning if somebody does this one time, they will always look better going forward than they would have had they never done it, curves. Um, but in terms of average time when people repeat procedures, Number one, procedures never have to be repeated. They can be repeated if a patient elects to, obviously. So if the aging has gotten to the point where it's bothering somebody enough, again, that procedure can be repeated. Light retractor. Light retractor. <clears throat> but on the average, five years to 15 years, do you need to have it done again? Never have to. It's like elective. Same thing in the first place. You do it in the first place because you want to. Um, so there's no obligation to repeat procedures. But many patients who have facial rejuvenation will do different procedures as they go through the aging process to maximize how good they look, how they look through their, through their aging. Aging is not stopped. Let's move the overheads off. Mm -hmm. Lights off, Deb. The little retractor I'm using lights up the inside of where I'm working here so I can see what I need to see. Vaskers. 
So who's a good candidate for a neck lift and a facelift? Mm -hmm. uh, good candidate is someone who is in generally good health and motivated, obviously. Um, you know, this is a high risk procedure in people who are not in good health, people who are heavy smokers, who don't have good skin quality. But in general, most people are a candidate and it really, be, it, the, the uh, indication really has to do with anatomy. Um, these procedures are customized. What I mean by that is we don't do the same procedure on every single person or the same steps on every single person. We do different steps on different people depending on what their anatomy is. And uh, so some people we just fix the front of the neck, that's all we do. Uh, other people we fix just the cheek and the jowl area, that's all we do. And then other people we do both like we're going to do today. Is there anything the patient should be doing prior to surgery to prepare for this? Uh, just generally, general good nutrition. Um, and most, most, most Americans are well nourished. So it's very well that, very rare that somebody doesn't have adequate nutrition on board. Uh, sometimes a little oral vitamin C a week or two before surgery can help uh, the healing process. And we routinely <clears throat> place our patients on a medicine called Arnica. And Arnica is an herbal medication that helps minimize bruising after surgery. And that's a medication patients start a day or two before surgery and continue for a few days after. Yeah. Here's the floral vicle next. Lovely. surgery this is a for those of you who are just joining us you are watching a live surgery this mm -hmm. is a neck lift and a lower facelift being done at the ohio clinic for aesthetic and plastic surgery dr michael witnowski is operating on dr gloria roman dr roman is an anesthesiologist and she is um worked with dr witnowski for several years as his anesthesiologist that's why she knows his work, and that's why she chose him to do this. You uh, obviously, viewer discretion, you were watching a live surgery. The surgery is going to take approximately three to four hours. And, uh, you know, what you're seeing right now, Doctor, what are we seeing right now? Yeah, uh, I'm in the neck, and what I'm working on, curses, are the what we call the turkey gobble muscles. Those muscle bands that you see in the front of the neck in certain age groups of people. The, the doctor term for that is platysma muscle, but it's basically the neck muscle or the turkey gobble muscle. And what we're trying to do is tailor those muscles on the inside so that those bands disappear and are not visible afterwards to the same degree that they are. Also, uh, we've removed, she has a little bit of excess fat in the neck. Um, everybody needs some fat in their neck so their neck looks good but sometimes it's a little extra. And so that's what I'm tailoring out right now. Another vascular. Another vascular. Moving. Have techniques changed in the 30 years you've been doing this? Oh yeah, procedures have, um, well, the biggest thing is when I was in training and we would do facial surgery, facelifts of this type, which were much more there were different procedure scissors, much different procedures at the time, but patients used to be in the hospital seven to ten days afterwards, which is just crazy to think about because everybody goes home now, sleeps in the comfort of their own bed, uh, and that has been allowed by better anesthesia, vascars, and better surgical techniques. The uh, bovin surgical techniques have improved so that they're more sophisticated and they're more directed, so we know what we can do to improve these problems. 
And probably 30 years ago, we didn't know as much as we know now. Well, for sure, not probably. Okay. And then a 405. And in the old days, these operations were the suction when I'm doing the bobbing, please. Mm -hmm. Suction. In the old days, um, these operations were yeah. plural. S strictly bedspread operations. And what I mean by that is big incisions were made and the skin only was tightened. Nobody knew what to do with the inside, the muscle or the no. fat. And when we did these bedspread operations, not only did they um, not achieve really satisfactory result in terms of longevity, because the infrastructure, the muscle and the fat was not adjusted, <clears throat> they also created a very unnatural result because we were depending on the skin to hold everything in place. And the techniques we use now, the skin is just a covering. It's not the structure that holds everything in place. It's the muscle work and the fat work that we do on the inside mm -hmm. that holds the results in place. Oh, yeah. Is this? Yeah. So we're about to do a uh, live cut-in for our TV audience. So for the um, web audience, why don't we switch to the other camera so they can continue watching what's going on. And uh, I'll be getting ready to do a hit for our TV <coughs> audience to tell them what we're going to be doing or what's happening right now on WKYC.com. So right now in, inside, I'm connecting the two edges of this muscle together so that when this is healed, doctor will have a nice smooth neckline without the visible signs of aging, which is the neck laxity of the muscle, which is itself at a time, sometimes for somebody's age. Hey everybody, it's Monica Robbins. You are uh, watching a live surgery on WKYC.com if you want. Obviously, viewer discretion advised, but uh, we are here at Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery where Dr. Michael Wotnowski is performing a neck lift and a lower face lift on Dr. Gloria Roman. It is live. You can, uh, we're not going to show it to our television audience. And uh, let's go back to Dave. No, <laughs> no, we don't know. Not for the TV audience. <laughs> this is probably not as interesting as the Browns' new acquisition. <laughs> However, we think it's pretty interesting. Raquel, you can pan over now. <laughs> yeah, he need make sure he knows that when we're doing that. So. I know we can't do both, but once once I start talking. Yeah, for the hits. I didn't show the, the surgery last time. I was just going to have her. Okay, Buffy. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Buzz. All right, Kelly, I want you to hold down here and then give me the curves. Down here. Mm -hmm. right there. there you go, just like that. That's perfect.
All right, Bovin, you can let go. Mm -hmm. I heard this. All right, let's take this out. Let me see how it looks. Take this out, both of them. That looks pretty good, I think. All right, let me have the bovi and the suction ready. <laughs> All right, bovi, please. So I'm just tailoring these muscles on the inside here. The O caps is not a good signal. No. The O caps touch MD is the best signal. Well, I'm just using my hotspot, but I can't. Scissors? This one? What do you need to get the live on it? Oh, this isn't going to work. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. I have to use an iPhone, so. Both in, or uh, pickups? Yeah. Actually, you know what, Amy? Um, you know what? I'm not even going to call. Right, I'm going to take, until, after I do this, I'm going to take another 4 0. It's 8 o'clock, so okay. I'm not calling for 20 minutes. Okay. All right. um, oh, this keeps popping out. You want to keep that one with you then? Or? I'll keep it with okay, me. Okay, piece of 4 0. You know what? This, doesn't, this isn't working either. I'm going to need yours. So maybe you can borrow Amy's to listen to I. Buzz here with my pickup. Yeah, it's fine. If you can, you pick up mine. It's FBI Quantico. All righty. I know, right? This is why your battery's dying. <laughs> See if you can pick up mine. All right, then I'll take the curved right, suture scissors. Suture scissors. And the vast curve. <clears throat> mm hmm right there. Hey, Mike, I'm going to take that for a second. Mm -hmm. All righty, scissors. All right, we're just about done the front part of the neck. Scissors, curve. Change sides with me. <clears throat> Deb, put the lights back on, please. Okay, adjust this left light. Two hooks. Don't do. Don't be flipping them around like that. Okay, hold here and here. All right, pickups and bovi. A little bit of fat here. Oh, um. All right, a little fat out of here. So the lady the tractor, please. Yeah. Bottom hook. Curve says. All righty. I'm going to have you bovine in one second. Uh-huh, bovine now. 
All right, take both of those out. Let me see how that looks. Still something right there. Change sides with me. Lights off again. Yep. Scissors. So, Dr. Manaus uh, mm -hmm. Winowski, we have a question from sure. a viewer. Carol wants to know, she tweeted me this question. She wants to know, she has had bariatric surgery and she's considered plastic surgery. She wants to know what kinds of plastic surgery that do you do? Do you perform tummy tucks? Yeah, and it, you know, facelifts are very common procedures, obviously, but you know, as a, as a cosmetic plastic surgeon, we uh, kind of do the whole roadmap of the body. So all the way from tummy tucks to uh, breast lifts, which are two of the most common procedures that people who have had bariatric surgery need. Um, and then um, occasionally thigh lifts. And one of the very most common operations in the United States right now, it's very popular, buzz here, is arm lift. It's called brachioplasty. And uh, that sort of evolved out of bariatric surgery patients who lost a lot of weight and end up with a lot of loose skin. But there's a lot of people who have loose, saggy arms, sometimes even part of the aging process. So sometimes we'll do a little arm lift or a brachioplasty on someone who, uh, you know, especially a woman who likes to go with a short sleeve and so forth, and uh, they have that loose skin. Some people call it a bat wing. It's not always quite that dramatic. Um, and that's another common operation that we do. But for bariatric surgery patients, the most common procedures we do are tummy tucks and breast lift procedures. Um, the others fall in line depending on everybody. Everybody loses weight in a different way. So the residual after bariatric surgery is different in different people. Um, sometimes people have bariatric surgery need a facelift. Sometimes because the, uh, when you lose a volume in your face, it's like letting the air out of a balloon. So sometimes the face will lose some contour after bariatric surgery as well and they benefit from facelifting. And you know, facelifting is a, gener is, a, is, is a general term, but it's as general as automobile. You know, there are convertibles and SUVs and two-door coupes and so forth, and uh, facelifts the same way. There are different kinds of facelifts. So it's, although it's a generic term, uh, it's customized basically, as I said earlier, to the patient's anatomy. So the steps of a facelift vary. You can take that out and change sides of it. Steps of a facelift vary depending on the patient's anatomy. So for patients who have undergone this. Uh, bariatric mm -hmm. surgery, what are some of the things they need to remember when considering a plastic surgeon and, and also like prior to? Well, if somebody's going to undergo bariatric surgery, one of the things that sometimes people don't really pay attention to is, uh, you know, there are cosmetic things that occur after bariatric surgery <clears throat> that people don't always think about because people think about, I want to lose weight, which obviously the main goal of bariatric surgery is to bring the patient's weight in proportion so that their overall health is better. Less diabetes, less hypertension, less sleep apnea, and all those other things that are part of somebody who's morbidly obese or overweight. But one of the um, consequences of bariatric surgery is uh, deflating a balloon, which I sort of talked about before skin elasticity tends to be somewhat uh, poor in patient, patients who have been overweight. And so sometimes when they lose weight, their, their clothes are too big, their skin is too big for their body. So that's where bariatric surgery, tummy tucks and breast lifts and so forth come in. Um, for instance, if you lose weight and you have a pair of, of corduroy slacks that are size 40 and you lose weight down to size 32, those slacks have to be tailored to fit the 32 body. But the thing people have to remember, and this is with all surgery, is that the fabric we start out with, the quality of your skin, the color of your skin, uh, is the same skin that you started out with. So we don't give people new skin. We're tailoring their old skin. So the quality of any kind of a surgical result, even with facelifting, is very much contingent on the quality of the individual skin that they start out with. So you had talked about, um, uh, I'm sorry, is it brachioplasty, Just arm, light, arm surgery? Uh -huh. um, Rainey says she was born with what her family calls grandma arms, and uh, she referred to them as bat wings as well. But she wants to know, um, 
can you do, what's the best option for that? Liposuction or an upper arm lift? Uh, it's often a combination. One of the steps of arm contouring is almost always lipo contouring. Depending on the skin quality, sometimes all we do is liposuction or lipo contouring of the arm. But if somebody tends to have you know, that bat wing deformity where they have not only some excess fat but loose skin, then an upper arm lift is the, the more appropriate procedure for them. And the incision for an upper arm lift, uh, there are two. One is across the armpit, kind of a curved incision at the top part of the armpit, which is called a mini upper arm lift, short scar upper arm lift. Uh, that's in about 10% of cases. And then in about 80, 90% of cases, we do what we call an upper arm lift with an incision which goes down the inner part of the arm from the armpit to just below the elbow. And although that's a relatively long incision, it's hidden. On the, unless your arms are up in the air, uh, they're not going to be visible. Plain. So I've just finished the front part of the neck. We did some fat contouring. Uh, we tightened up the muscles of the neck. And now I'm just closing this tiny little incision. And this little incision, which is called a submental incision, is placed in a natural skin fold. So although all these incisions leave permanent scars, the face is a privileged healing area. And it's very uncommon for facial incisions to heal badly. Uh, they can, but not very commonly. More commonly, they sort of fade and blend in as time goes. So speaking of scarring, what should a patient be doing afterward to prevent as much scarring as sure. possible? Uh, we go through this uh, on an individual basis, but uh, the first week after surgery, other than showering and so forth, we don't have anybody really use anything on the incisions, maybe a little antibiotic medication. But once a patient's about a week healed, then we start them using a non-perfume type moisturizer, over-the-counter kind of a product usually, for the first few weeks. And I say non-perfume because the perfume products <clears throat> Although they smell good, they have a lot of alcohol in them, and they can be very irritating to a brand new incision. So first few weeks, a non-perfume product. And then after about a month, we have you start using a scar reduction product uh, for about three to four months after surgery. And how long you use it uh, depends on what kind of operation you've had done. And uh, certain areas of the body are more prone to forming more noticeable incisions, for instance, breasts, tummies, arms tend to be more prone to forming a noticeable incision, for instance, than a face does. Uh, the face is a magical area. I call the face a privileged healing area because um, properly done facial surgery, properly done by properly trained people, really should not be detectable by a stranger. So good cosmetic surgery of the face should look nice and look natural. And I always tell patients, don't expect the world to go up to you and say, who did your facelift? Because if they do, then that's not good. So when you have facial surgery, you may go around your friends that you haven't told, and they may not even notice, or they may say, ah, did you lose weight, or did you get your hair cut, or something. They won't quite know what it is. Kind of like if a man shaves a mustache off that he's had for 40 years. Nobody necessarily knows that he shaved the mustache, notices that he shaved the mustache off, they just knew something was different. <laughs> and if you can do a cosmetic procedure and achieve that kind of result, then I think you've achieved a good procedure. You know, the face, is a, it, it, you know, the face should look normal and natural when it's all done, not unnatural. <clears throat> you know, the face is not an inanimate object. It's not like the top of a drum. So skin has to have some laxity and some flexibility and movability. And this is why an overzealous facelift looks like an overzealous facelift. It looks unnatural. Properly done facelift, patients look better, but they shouldn't look abnormal. <clears throat> Deb, I'm going to need my stool. Mm -hmm. Donna wants to know... Um, how much this type of procedure costs and how long is the downtime? A <clears throat> um, couple, couple things. Uh, downtime after facial surgery um, varies depending on what you do, but in terms of uh, 
I sort of use the analogy away, away from nosy friends. How long do you want to be away from your nosy girlfriends, people you didn't tell you did this? Uh, on the average, about two weeks. Uh, usually you're back in makeup at two weeks. Uh, men can grow a beard, and that works like makeup. Uh, or you can use coverall, if you need, cover uh, foundation if you need to. But most people look pretty good in a couple of weeks. Um, you will continue to heal for months after surgery. So even though you look pretty good at moist, look pretty good at two weeks, <laughs> you'll look better at four weeks, you'll look better at three months, you'll look better at six months, really for up to a year. Um, get to the second part of that in a second. Here's our incision under here. Tiny little incision, it's not even quite an inch long. And almost everybody has an incision under their neck because almost everybody fell when they were a child. So it's very uncommon for, for people not to have an under the neck incision. <clears throat> Come an ointment. <clears throat> In terms of cost, cost of surgery varies um, depending on uh, exactly what you're having done. Uh, you know, from, from a few thousand dollars to many, many thousands of dollars. And so uh, I think the important thing is you're not buying a car. So you have to do your homework. So when you're deciding to have some surgery, you want to make sure you go to a board certified plastic surgeon. And I have to tell you, Cleveland, Ohio has a really huge talent of board certified plastic surgeons. So we're, we should be proud of that as a city uh, as compared to some cities where the talent pool is not so great. Um, and you want to make sure you go to a board certified plastic surgeon. And uh, when you go for a consultation, that's not an obligation. A consultation, in my opinion, should be an educational process local in a tape. <clears throat> so when a patient comes for a consultation, our job is to educate them. Here's what, tell me what's bothering you, and here's what we need to do to improve what your issues are. And uh, whether in this particular case, it was a cheek and a neck lift. In some situations, like I said, it's just a neck lift. In some situations, it's just a cheek lift. But it's important to get the proper information. And, uh, you know, often we'll say, patients will say, oh, well, my girlfriend went here, and they were going to do it for X number of dollars. And my other girlfriend went here, and they were going to do it for X number of dollars all the year forward. And, uh, you know, it's, it's again, you're not buying it. You're not buying a car. You're not buying a commodity. You're buying education, training, skill set, and experience of the operating surgeon. And this is why people that are certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, you know, that's sort of the gold standard for people who are going to have elective cosmetic surgery, in my opinion. And, you know, you don't want to, uh, don't buy a procedure because one place is cheaper than the other buy a procedure based on those other factors that I talked about. Education, experience, skill set, you know. How many facelifts has this doctor done? Oh, well, I've done one. Well, would you rather have a facelift done by somebody who's done one or two or somebody who's done hundreds or thousands? Um, obviously, with anything in life, the more you do, the better you get in general. Certainly, certainly things that require artistry and skill set. So the experience of the surgeon Education of the surgeon is really, really important. So when you get a consultation, you want to make sure you pay particular attention to those things. That's a long-winded answer, I think. But <laughs> hopefully That's it answered your questions. So for those, again, who are just joining us, you are watching a live plastic surgery. We're in Westlake at the uh, Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery with Dr. Michael Witnowski, who is performing a, a neck lift and lower face lift on Dr. Gloria Next. Roman. Mm -hmm. um, doctor, what, what is so important about having the surgical suite right here in your office? Uh, well, there's so, so many advantages to having a uh, surgical suite on site. Uh, our operating room is accredited <clears throat> appropriately by the American Association for Accreditation of Surgical Facilities. Um, and the whole purpose of having an operating room like this is twofold, patient convenience and privacy. Uh, safety is number one, so everything we do, safety is number one. And number two goal is a good cosmetic result, obviously, but safety being number one. So all the precautions we take on a daily basis 
are done in an effort to provide the safest experience for the patient. Um, along the line of that is privacy. And because this is a, what I call a mono-specialty operating room, this is a facility where we only do cosmetic plastic surgery, as opposed to a hospital facility where they may do cataracts and orthopedic surgery and general surgery and so forth. So we're able to control the cost a little better for the patient experience. Uh, obviously, you can see there's a lot of people involved with doing a procedure like this. It's not like you know you go in and there's you and the doctor. So the overhead is wrapped up in all that, of course. But because we don't have to worry about other procedures other than plastic surgery, we are able to control the cost a little bit better. So it's a little more cost effective for a patient to have a procedure in this type of an outpatient environment. So again, if you have questions for the doctor, you can tweet me at Monica Robbins or go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC, well. and uh, ask away. I have um, tweets pinned at the top, and I have a, a Facebook story pinned at the top. Just comment in the comment section or reply to uh, my tweet, and One you more. can have well. your questions answered. The doctor will answer them as he's performing. Now, obviously, in a situation where he needs to focus on what he's doing. It's We're not going to ask him any questions. He's going to let us know when that happens. There is part uh, time in this surgery that it's not appropriate to ask questions. So we were following his rules. You can tell that we are all scrubbed up. We follow the same infection protocol as the medical team. I'm here in the corner looking for your questions on, mm. uh, on my laptop. So um, doctor, I have another one. You, you talked about, we're here in Westlake in your office, mm -hmm. but um, some folks wanna know in the event of an emergency, what happens? Okay, well, it's a very good question. Uh, our staff is what they call ACLS certified. So our anesthesiologist and, and the uh, medical staff is uh, certified to handle an emergency. Uh, should there be an emergency that would require a hospital admission, uh, St. John West Shore Hospital is our hospitals right down the street from us and uh, that's, that's where a patient would go. Uh, because these operations are relatively superficial surgeries, even though they are a surgery nonetheless, uh, we're not operating in a body cavity, we're really kind of operating on the outside. So those kinds of unexpected events are certainly random. Uh, we take all precautions during surgery while somebody's asleep to prevent what we call uh, uh, thrombophilbitis or pulmonary embolism. So this patient has on stockings on her calves called SCDs, sequential compression devices, and they are on through the entire case until she wakes up, and they help augment the blood flow through the lower extremity, kind of mimicking as if she was walking. So it's a good circulation issue. And then uh, Dr. Shaw, king of the ship, the anesthesiologist is the king of the ship, and it's his job to monitor the patient's pulse, blood pressure, respirations throughout the entire procedure. But that's a very good question. Now I'm going to let this work for a couple minutes, so if you have some questions you want to ask, it's a good time to ask them. Some more questions. Here's some more local. I'm going to wait and do the other side later. So, Come in a minute. Julie has a lot of questions. Can I ask you? Sure. Um, okay, so you already answered um, how long is the recovery process for a procedure like this, but can you just reiterate, a lot of these questions we're going to be asking again just so sure. people are tuning um, in at different times. Let's talk about the initial recovery. This patient will go to our recovery room after surgery for about an hour and a half. They have a towel, please. <clears throat> for about an hour and a half, then she'll go home. She'll come back tomorrow, at which time we will take her bandage off and leave it off, wash her hair for her, and then... Um, I'll see her again four or five days later, a week later, three or four weeks later, six to eight weeks later, and those are sort of the routine follow-up visits. Okay. In terms of patients being able to do things socially, you know, their bandage is off the next day. I mean, some people go out and about the next day, but most people kind of hibernate at least that first week or so, um, just because it's pretty, pretty visible, pretty noticeable you've had surgery, especially the first, first uh, week. Bruising and swelling are maximum the first 48 hours, and then they begin to diminish after that. 
Um, things such as aerobics, jogging, tennis, exercise, heavy lifting, things that raise your pulse and your blood pressure in a sustained manner. People should avoid those for about a month after surgery, but driving and daily activities within about a week. Maybe you put her back up and lower the table a little bit for me. Does someone need up. to take antibiotics? Uh -huh. Down a little bit more. No, the standard, the standard of care for elective surgery procedures these days is to give one dose of intravenous antibiotic at the beginning of the procedure, which was done a half hour before we start. Uh, and that's usually an adequate amount of antibiotic, especially for a low a low risk procedure like facial surgery, where infection is very rare, maybe one out of 100 if that. Uh, and if a patient develops a facelift infection, it's usually something small like a pimple or a stitch abscess or something, nothing major. But in general, one dose of IV antibiotic at the onset of the procedure is adequate. If for some, some reason there would be an infection after surgery, which is again remote, then that would be handled with additional medication as needed. But to put somebody on an antibiotic afterwards is not necessary in general for this type of procedure. Tape, okay, please. I'm going to be talking to our TV audience in just a moment. So. Uh... Okay, we're going to start this side. Mm -hmm. we can, <clears throat> light, please, Deb. So now we've finished. So those the... of you watching the. They're talking in my ear. Those of you watching on the live stream, give me two seconds. We're going to be talking to Channel 3 for a second. Yeah, the hey, everybody. It's Senior Health Correspondent Monica Robbins. We are live in the OR in Westlake at the Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic 15. Surgery. Dr. Michael Witnowski is sitting right here to my mm. left performing surgery on a patient. He is doing a lower neck lift and a, a face lift. And... Um, we want your questions. Tweet them to me at Monica Robbins, or you can uh, go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC. I have pinned uh, comments here that you can comment your questions. He's been answering questions all morning. We've been at this now for about an hour. We have another two to three hours uh, still ahead, so make sure you tune in to WKYC.com to watch. All righty. 15 hour Bronx. I don't have to do that. I was getting the wrap, so I. No, it was good. Okay. So we're done. Yes, we're done with Jenny. We don't have yes. to do another one. No. Okay. All right. Let me have a um, double. You can up. have your phone back. And then a mosquito. And then I can take this off. Open. Mm -hmm. We're all discombobulated here. Uh, you could throw that in the bag right there. All right. So we are oh. online the rest of the uh, time until the surgery is finished. So just for those of you who are um, wondering, we're going to be staying on this start to finish. We will stop the live stream when uh, Dr. Witnowski is obviously finished and Gloria is about to be wheeled into recovery. That's when uh, your live stream will end. Let me go back to Julie's questions. Um, Mm -hmm. You kind of answered this one too. On average, how long does a patient have to wear a bandage on their face overnight, after procedure? Only overnight. Oh, okay. One so night. They don't have to look like a mummy for a week nope, or anything. No bandage after the first day. What sort of complications are associated with this type of procedure? Uh, the very most common complication, it's called a hematoma. It's where somebody can develop some pooling of bleeding under the bedspread or under the skin. So fix the light, please. Double. Mm -hmm. um, hematoma is very uncommon. It happens in about one out of 100 patients. Um, and it can happen anywhere from in the recovery room and the patient's waking up from anesthesia to 15 to three or four weeks later. More commonly, it happens earlier as opposed to later. Um, easily handled. 
and no problems from it if it's handled. And what handling it means is the bleeding has to be controlled. So if that would happen, we would bring the patient back into the operating room, open up the area where there's bleeding, and then we would control that bleeding and then put the patient back together. So this is a good question and one probably a lot of people would have, um, but on a scale of one, a zero to 10, how many insurance companies are likely to cover a procedure like this? Zero. Yeah, and can you explain why? Yeah, this, you know, uh, this is an elective procedure. Uh, what I mean by that is no one needs to have a facelift to get through their life, so to speak. It's not like a gallbladder operation or something of that nature where somebody may need for medical reasons. Uh, so, you know, health carriers um, cover only what they feel like they have to cover. And in general, those are medical necessity type things. And a facelift is not a medical necessity. So uh, for those of you who are wondering, our patient, Dr. Roman, she is 57 years old. Um, she's also told us that she has uh, tried several um, non-surgical uh, um, procedures to try and control uh, her lines on her neck. Um, she had done radiofrequency, which is thermage. She had done Botox. She had done uh, lasers. Is that something that... Um, you would recommend before somebody decides to go under the knife? I think it's a, a, it's a personal preference. Uh, the non-surgical uh, procedures certainly don't provide the, the, the drama and long last of a surgical procedure, but they certainly don't carry with them the, you know, the downtime issues and so forth. The, the disadvantage of a non-surgical procedure is that, okay, um, change hands. Mm -hmm browns and scissors over here <clears throat> is that um, straight mm -hmm. is that they do require chronic repetition and maintenance the other thing is that all those non-surgical procedures treat a focused area for instance when you have filler put around the mouth. It's put in the what they call the nasolabial fold or the cheek fold. Or you have Botox in the forehead or the frown line. You know, it, it treats sort of that one area. And um, it's kind of like, um, I have some crazy analogies, but it's kind of like a road. You know, you have potholes in the road. There's two ways to fix those potholes. One of them is to patch the hole up, and the other one is to repave the, repave the road. Well, what looks better, works better, and lasts longer? Obviously, the repaving. So surgery is a little more extensive up front, but long term, better results, longer lasting, and more formal results. So non-surgical procedures are very, very common. Um, they certainly have a place, obviously. We do a lot of non-surgery in our office. Um, but sometimes people will do those for a while and then at a point in time, they'll be like, okay, I'm ready to move it. I'm ready to do something more, more formidable. You know, something else to consider is the cost of those non-surgical procedures to the cost of, you Oh, know. absolutely. You know, non-surgical procedures are, are not inexpensive. These are uh, products provided by these manufacturers, scissors and uh, And uh, they're costly and uh, that cost gets repeated. So, you know, somebody has a few years of non-surgery, they've uh, sometimes spent the same, if not more than they would have had they dived in and gone ahead and have a facial rejuvenation procedure. So, um, to some degree, it's a better investment, but that's always a personal decision, obviously. Can people, like, Obviously, you can take out a loan if you want to really have this done. Can you? Is there a payment system as well? Yeah, there are different uh, ways of financing cosmetic surgery, and you know that's discussed with patients when they come in for their consultation. But there are several uh, national companies that are uh, recognized by the American Board of Plastic Surgery that uh, do uh, financing for elective type procedures.
Um, um, we have a question. How many different types of facelifts are there? Um, there's not a specific number of how many different types of facelift are there. What it really has to do with is the um, anatomy of the individual patient. So um, some patients you will only need to approach the front part of the neck like we did in Gloria at the beginning of the case. Sometimes that's all we need to do in some patients. Some patients just need the cheek and the jowl area treated, which is what we're going to do now. Um, or some pa patients need both areas treated, which is what we're doing in Gloria. So it's not a matter of uh, type of facelift. It's a matter of uh, degree of facelift. What kind of facelift are you doing based on the patient's anatomy? How do you know if you're a candidate for a full facelift or just a lower facelift? Mm -hmm. um, again, that's determined by um, consultation with a doctor and really what your anatomy is. The other part of the face that you know, we're not tackling today, but you know, sometimes we will do same time or different time what we call upper facial rejuvenation. And that can be something such as a forehead lift or a brow lift a blepharoplasty or eyelid tuck procedures, upper and or lowers. Uh, and those are common procedures as well. Sometimes they're done all by themselves, or sometimes they're done at the same time we do this kind of a procedure. So we have another viewer question. Um, can you uh, explain the difference and which is, uh, which is um, more effective? Cool sculpting or liposuction? Is cool sculpting as effective as liposuction? Um, short and long answer. Cool sculpting is effective and it will give an improvement, but it will not give the same degree of improvement as a liposuction procedure. Um, when you have a cool sculpting procedure, it will give you about a 20% reduction in an area of pinch. So none of these procedures, including liposuction, are weight loss procedures. They're sculpting procedures. So if you have a fat roll in your abdomen, then if you pinch it, it's about four inches thick, and you lip cool sculpt that area, you can reduce that about 20%, so about an inch. Cool sculpting, no downtime, off the procedure, and it can be repeated. So if after you do one cool sculpting, it's not adequate, you can come back and repeat and do more cool sculpting cycles to get a further reduction. So say you end up with three inches, next time you come back three months or six months later and repeat it, you can reduce maybe down to two inches. No downtime, no anesthesia, no healing. Liposuction on the other hand, uh, which is a procedure that is a time-tested procedure. I actually did the first liposuction in Cleveland in 1982, which is hard to believe. I wasn't even born then. But um, <laughs> it is a, one of the most popular cosmetic surgery procedures done in the world. Uh, as a procedure, it's evolved. Techniques have evolved, equipment have evolved, and so forth. But what liposuction will do is it'll take that four inches, hold this, and in one procedure, one anesthesia, one set of healing, will reduce that four inches down to an appropriate level um, more dramatically than cool sculpting. So that's the long answer. Short answer is they're both effective procedures depending on what your goal is. Now, some people will dive right in and do liposuction from the get-go. Some people will do cool sculpting and be happy with it. And then some people are like, you know, this hasn't gotten me what I want. And they always have the option of doing cool sculpting at, a, at a, another time if need be. Now we are just, just so you know what we're doing right now, we're working on the bedspread, the outer layer of the face, which is the skin. We're making a little space or a little pocket under that skin so I have access to the inside layer of the face, the fat and muscle of the face, which is what we're going to adjust, which will really help get the nice contour. Raise the table, please.
<coughs> Vasker? Buzz? Will her stitches fall out? We use dissolvable, absorbable sutures, uh, both on the inside and the outside. The sutures we use on the inside tend to last about three to four months, and that holds the inside layers together until your body's own natural healing process has created a nice scar membrane to hold the new tissue, the new uh, uh, levels in place, the new layers in place, excuse me. Uh, outside stitches dissolve about seven to 10 days after surgery. Certainly for anybody that's watching this, I think you'll realize uh, the complexity of what we're doing. Um, this is very focused, detailed surgery. Uh, this is not a fly-by-night operation by any stretch of the imagination, and it needs to be done properly. <clears throat> Gloria is a very healthy person, and she has very nice quality tissues with which to work. She's a non-smoker, uh, which is huge. We love non-smokers. They heal better, they bruise less, they swell less, and moreover, they get a better result. Let's release this just a little bit. One thing I neglected to do at the beginning of the case, I thought about it, no, I thought about it again, I was to thank my staff here. Uh, Deb is our circulating nurse. She's the lady that you see running around waiting on us. And then Deandra and Kelly at the table here are assistants. And then Dr. Shah is our anesthesiologist. And again, this is a team effort. <clears throat> and then when the patient wakes up, she'll go to the recovery area where our recovery room nurse, Karen, will intercept her and take care of her until she's discharged to home. So one of the questions that comes up is cost. And uh, just put that all together. And I think it gives people a little bit more insight into the cost of surgery. Plus, we built this state-of-the-art facility so that we can provide quality state-of-the-art procedure. And again, this is a team effort. Sounds like me. It was you. I'm logging on to, for those of you who are wondering, like you can now watch this on our YouTube at Deb WKYC. And uh, some of you had said you're not going to be able to watch the entire um, procedure. That's okay. You'll Masters. be able to, uh, this, it'll be archived on our uh, okay. Channel 3 YouTube page. Um, so you'll be able to go and watch. I see 23 people are watching right Buzz. now. If any of you guys have questions, uh, go to my Facebook page or tweet me. And uh, the doctor will answer your question right here. Um, oh, how... Okay, you, you sort of answered this, but again, you know, like I said, we've been doing this for about uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, how do I know if I, I found the right plastic surgeon for the procedure I want done? What questions do you ask? What questions do you ask? Well, first of all, uh, you want to make sure the surgeon is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, number one. <clears throat> number two, you want to uh, 
Certainly word of mouth is very helpful. If you know someone who's been to a physician or physicians and had a good experience, that's very helpful. Uh, another thing is to, uh, besides board certification, uh, making sure that that surgeon uh, has adequate continuing medical education. You know, uh, we, on the average, do about, watch the face please, do to about 50 to 100 hours a year of continuing education, conferences, meetings, seminars, and so forth, so that we can keep up with the latest of specialty. Um, additionally, and you can certainly ask these questions, a lot of it's visible on a, on a person's website, but you know, websites uh, can be manufactured too, so you want to make sure you get the questions answered in person as well. Uh, and how many of these do you do? I mentioned it before. You know, do you want the doctor doing your facelift who is uh, fresh out of school or who doesn't have a cosmetic practice and so isn't a specialist and maybe does a facelift or two randomly here or there? Lower the table, Dr. Shaw. Uh, or do you want a surgeon who does these procedures on a regular basis uh, who will, that's good, who will give you the best possible result? You know, any, any surgeon, no matter what the surgery, can have complications. <clears throat> complications are very uncommon. Uh, they're pretty much preventable. Uh, they're certainly not life-threatening in our business, but in general, they're, they're sort of cosmetic complications. Uh, Q-tip and uh, browns. One more of those. Um, but we want to do everything we can to minimize those complications. And certainly the expertise of a board certified surgeon is to be able to treat complications if they occur better prevent them but if they occur to treat them I'm working on the inside layer of the face the fancy name for it is SMAS S -M -A -S, and that's the inside layer of fat and muscle covering that has relaxed rounds, with the aging process and that's what I'm marking out now Anyway, did I answer that question yep. adequately for you? I think so. Blue? You know, the, uh, the other thing that people don't always think about is that people will say, well, how do, you, how do I you guarantee I'm going to get a perfect result? Well, there's no guarantees in life with anything. But I can tell you, Bobby, <clears throat> Everything we do shows. So you have facial surgery. It's there for the world to see. So there's kind of a built-in fail-safe. You know, every time I do a procedure, I want to get, get the best possible result. That patient has to live with that result. So do I. And I want him to live with a happy result, a good result, not a substandard result. So that's kind of a built-in fail-safe as well. Curses. Is it appropriate to ask for um, patient references? Uh, we have many patients who are perfectly willing privately to talk to other patients. We have patients who are so happy, they're like, God, if you ever want to have anybody talk to me, I'd be happy to talk to somebody. And so we do that occasionally, as needed, Bobby. Um, you know, obviously we would not do that without somebody's permission. Just like when we take pictures in the office, those pictures become part of the patient's medical record. So uh, privacy of utmost importance. There are people who have these kinds of surgery who, uh, you know, come in the back door and don't want anybody to know they're doing it. And there's other people who want the whole world to know. And we all have a different level of privacy and we respect that privacy. But if patient wishes, to, if someone wants to talk to somebody who's been through surgery in our hands, we're happy to arrange that. Uh, one of the advantages of being the, having been around for so long is that a lot of people know a lot of people know a lot of people. So it's pretty hard for somebody not to find somebody that I've operated on out there in the real world. And I don't mean that in a, sort of, in a braggadocious manner, I'm just saying there are plenty of people out there who have had experience 
with me in my practice and our offices. And uh, I can tell you one thing. We do everything we can to make people as comfortable through the whole process from start to finish. A lot of hand-holding. We're always available by phone. We're always available to people pop in for me to see them if need be on an unexpected basis if somebody's worried about something. Um, both in, and then a 3 0 bike one. <clears throat> Browns. Now I'm working on the inside layer of the face called the SMAS. So we fixed the front part of the muscle. Now this is the back part of the muscle. And that's allowing me to improve the neck contour even further than I already have. 3 0. And needle holder incisors. So we're doing some suture tailoring of this. This is the money. It's this, what I mean by that is this is the layer that makes the difference and how they look when it's all said and done. Natural and longevity of the result. Slide down. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. Mm -hmm. Pull it out. Short. The, uh, the official numbers just came out on Monday about what the most common uh, plastic surgery and, and is and breast augmentation continues to be mm. number one um, yeah, breast by, aug go ahead. by yeah by a wide margin yeah breast augmentation surgery is still extremely extremely popular in our country um, as is liposuction uh, rhinoplasties eyelid tucks uh, I believe those are the top four or five that they listed um, but um, Brachioplasty, arm lift, which we talked about, has seen an increase, as has facial, face lifting. Uh, face lifting is done in large numbers every year, but the non-surgical machines came along, and so a lot of people who were going to have a facelift went ahead and did some of the non-surgical procedures. Many patients were, uh, you know, like Gloria here, were like, okay, it helps me, but it didn't do what I wanted to do. So let me go ahead and do the real thing. So for those who are watching, um, they see uh, the device that's making Gloria's cheek glow. Can you talk <laughs> about what that is? Yeah, that's called a fiber optic lighted retractor. <clears throat> and it's technology that's actually further enhanced my ability to do what I need to do because it allows us to see inside under the skin, under the bedspread, so that I can see precisely what I'm doing. Oops, um, and make sure I have really well controlled bleeding. Um, there are some surgeons that wear a, what they call a headlight, where they wear it on the top of their uh, scrub cap that shines in the wound. And that's just another way another new technology that allows us to see better than, uh, than before we used to have this. I find the lighter retractor really very nice. It gives me a nice, nice, it's like a landscape. I can see exactly what I'm doing. 3-0. So I have a question from someone who um, uh, says she has thinning skin on her hands and she's wondering if there's a procedure for hands. Excellent question. Um, hand aging is, uh, there's no magic for it at this point in time. Um, some of the fillers are approved to be used on the top of the hand. And the problem with hands is they deflate. Not only do you get poor skin quality, which often happens, but you also lose volume and you know the air in the balloon, which I used earlier, you lose volume in the top of your hand, and then all of a sudden you can see every one of those little veins and crevices and bones and so forth. And filler, uh, there's different kinds of filler, 
or that are approved to be injected in the top of the hand to camouflage those uh, issues. That is one place where filler worked very well and tends to be long lasting. Uh, pretty straightforward procedure to go through. There's no wonderful, there's no magical surgical procedure out there for hands that um, is highly recommended at this point. So, the thing, the one, just one more thing. Go ahead. The thing you have to mention, realize about a hand, a hand is a very important functional structure. So you don't want to do anything that could interfere with the patient's ability to use their hands. So that's why caution is very important in terms of what you do with hands. So there's a very popular TV show uh, where plastic surgeons are, are fixing botched jobs. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you get potential clients asking you to fix a bad result from someone else, and how hard is it to fix one? Well, we see it all the time, you know, people that have had uh, surgery elsewhere and they're not pleased with the results. I often encourage those people to go back to their original surgeon who did the surgery, who knows the roadmap of the surgery, uh, to allow that doctor the opportunity to correct a disappointed result. Uh, because there's a certain percentage of patients that need touch-ups and benefit from touch-up procedures. Uh, but beyond that, uh, correcting complicated, correcting a post-surgical result, relax on that again, uh, can be pretty straightforward or it can be pretty darn complex depending on where it is what part of the body it involves and, and so forth. Um, but you know, all of us do secondary procedures. What I mean by that are touch-up procedures or secondary procedures, you know, on our own patients or other patients. And uh, uh, we have to set expectations for patients because sometimes the patients are requesting, and you see this on botched, don't tell anybody, but I have watched a couple episodes, <laughs> curved scissors. I have to know, you know. Um, you'll see patients who, and you know, both of those doctors on botch are board certified surgeons, one a facial plastic surgeon and one a plastic surgeon. Um, so they're skilled and well trained. And you know, you'll see patients on box, botched who come in simply with unrealistic expectations. And they're like, oh, okay, bye bye. Go some, you know, bye. I have nothing I can do to help you for, for a <clears throat> full length. But then you'll see patients who have legitimate untoward results, and they would benefit from a secondary corrective procedure to improve those results. Now, I'm still working on this inner layer of the face called the SMAS, and we're working on the, on the cheek part of it right now. And that lifts the jowl, the cheek fold, Baskers. It's still attached. Both of them. <clears throat> All righty. Everything is going very well. One thing that Botched has brought to the, the viewership, you know, obviously it's a, it's a Hollywood uh, program, so they have to have the histrionics wrapped, into it, wrapped in it, and I understand that. But one thing that has brought to, the, brought to the forefront is about training. You know, one of the things they emphasize is um, about proper skill and proper training. And, you know, um, you know, most plastic surgeons, after medical school, train an average of six to eight years before they're out on their own. So just add up all those years. And then there are courses that are given in the country 
where doctors who are not plastic surgeons can go and take a course for a weekend and learn how to do some of the things we do. And I guess my question to the public is, is it logical to think that a person who takes a weekend course has the same skill set, expertise, predictability of result as someone who trained six to eight years after residency, excuse me, after medical school, and someone who's experienced. So if there's one message I can give people is be an educated consumer. You know, you don't, would you hire a plumber to do your electrical work? You don't even think twice about it. No, I'm going to hire a plumber. But for some reason, Kurt, in our business, patients don't always educate themselves. It also seems that lately, especially with non-cosmetic procedures, that a lot of non-physicians or, or physicians in other fields are getting into the field, especially dealing with Botox. And I did a story several years ago about a dentist who actually did liposuction on someone and uh, he botched that job. So, you know, you talked about make sure they're board certified um, plastic surgeon, but uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to cost. So you, you talk about somebody being an educated consumer, what, what really should they be asking and when, when do they know there's a red flag? Um, well, obviously training, education, skill set, experience are all important. And that's information that's you know, out there for the world to see you know, on the web and, and so forth. And certainly when you go for a consultation um, red flag, well, that's a tough one. Um, high pressure, when you go for a consultation, there should be, curve says, should be not high, no high pressure. But um, buyer beware. And back to my car analogies, because I love cars. If you go to a car dealer and they say, I'm going to sell you that $20,000 car but today we have a deal and I'm going to sell it to you for $5,000. You better damn well, oh, I shouldn't have said that. You better look under the engine because under the hood because there's probably no engine in there. And it's the same thing with our business. Buyer beware, beware of the, you know, cost cutting. For instance, products such as Botox, Juvederm, filler, the non-surgical products, curses. Those products have a cost and that cost is predetermined by the manufacturer. And so somebody says, well, my girlfriend went here and she got her Botox for this much. Well, how much Botox did she get? Did they use FDA approved Allergan Botox? How many units did she have put in? So the consumer's comment is, oh, my girlfriend had Botox and it was only X number of dollars. Did the doctor dilute the Botox properly? Did they inject the recommended, manufactured recommended amount of Botox? These are things that, um, if it sounds good to be true, you got to be careful, Baskers. Do you have any recommendations for crepey skin, legs, and arms? Oh boy, I wish I did. Um, you know, certainly um, we know that. Moisturizer is very effective for facial treatment uh, in terms of skin quality and so forth. And I think the same thing applies to the body areas. Uh, you know, you can't, it's like I said, you lose weight, you still have the same pants, same material. And that's the problem, when, you know, when you've got that kind of skin, you know, you can't get rid of it. You can't get new skin. But some of the things that can be done um, can improve the overall appearance. Moisturizer being, gosh, the moisturizer is so important. There's no magic moisturizer. The key is to use a moisturizer. Body, face, wherever. And the key is when you use a moisturizer, put it on moist skin. Because moisturizer doesn't only provide moist, moisture, it helps maintain moisture. So the first thing that people do, they wash their face, then they dry their face, then they put the moisturizer on. Don't dry your face first. 
spray a moist mist of saline mist or something, then put the moisturizer on, and it will work a whole lot better for you if you do it that way. But unfortunately, when, you know, certain kinds of skin, you just can't, you just can't, uh, Deb, can you dress it like here? You just can't uh, give yourself, you can't give new skin. Now, there are some lifting procedures that can help the quality of skin. Like if you've got lousy abdominal wall skin from pregnancy or weight fluctuations and so forth, tummy tuck won't give you new skin, but it can take the skin that's there and improve its overall contour by tightening. So excess flab, excess tissue is removed. The tissue you have left is still the same skin you had in the first place, but it looks better because it's tighter. Let's go back to the bed sheet. You take a bed sheet out of the dryer it's all wrinkled and so forth. But if you lay it on the bed and then you kind of move it out and smooth it out, it looks better. And that's the same thing with skin. You didn't change the bed sheet, you didn't change the skin, but by leveling it, tightening it, you made it look better. My staff teases me about my analogies, so I apologize if they're silly. <laughs> but anyway, maskers. So I, I would I would anticipate all surgeries are complex. So what is the most complex one you do, and how long does it take? Probably one of the most complex operations that cosmetic surgeons do are rhinoplasties, uh, nose surgeries, uh, very small area, very intricate anatomy. Um, and I'm talking about of elective cosmetic procedures. Uh, you know, when you get into the non-cosmetic world, there's a whole many layers of complicated procedures. But in terms of the cosmetic world, yeah, all procedures are complex. And actually all of the procedures not only are complex, the specific procedures have different levels of complexity. Some facelifts are more complex than others. Buzz. Some rhinoplasties are more complex than others. Take that out now. Can you give somebody a six-pack ab with a tummy tuck? <laughs> eh, you know, that sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that one of those too good to be true promises? That's one of those. There, there are people who um, purport to be able to do that. Um, some of the Latin American surgeons. Um, I'm not sure, Buzz, please, that that's realistic in, uh, Buzz, Buzz, <coughs> realistic in most cases. Okay. That, that's a great point. Can you talk a bit about, um, you know, medical tourism and traveling to get, especially plastic surgery? Mm -hmm. I, I know of a lot of people who've gone Double to hooked. Thailand and Mexico. And, and those places, what, what do people have to bear in mind just because it's cheaper? What happens well, if something goes out. wrong? Well, you're screwed, uh, huh? to be honest. And, uh, you know, you really, you really, uh, that doesn't, straight, that doesn't mean that there are not legitimate good surgeons in those countries, because there are. There's a lot of really skilled international plastic surgeons. But, Often, the let's make a deal clinics that you find in these other non-United States countries, often those procedures are not necessarily being performed by the good people in those countries. Uh, and uh, so sometimes people fall in the wrong hands. And, uh, but, you know, uh, like retractor. <clears throat> Anybody, no matter how skilled they are, no matter how many surgeries they've done, can have an unforeseen event happen, complication. And I think you're much better off if you are in the community where your surgeon lives, works, hold this, than uh, leg retractor. Take that out. No, just, okay, here. Um, you need to have somebody take care of you if you have a problem. 
the Oscars. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to find somebody who's willing to intercept that problem. You know, we, we are happy to take care of our own complications. Um, so again, buyer beware, because sometimes the money people think they're saving up front, they end up spending that and more when they have an untoward result. And so the surgery that they could have done in their community for X number of dollars ends up costing X, Y plus dollars because not only do they pay the fee somewhere else, if they have a problem, they have to pay to handle the problem. And uh, it's just better to <clears throat> have your surgeon or someone who works with your surgeon able to help take care of you, I think. <clears throat> All right, we're going to redrape this face on this side. I don't know if you can see this or not, but <clears throat> we have, um, here's our original incision. Is this showing anywhere or no? Uh, yeah. Okay, here's the original incision, and this is the extent of what I've lifted up inside and outside layer, and then you can see what we're going to do here to reposition Gloria's excess tissue <clears throat> over here, blue and brown. Four of Velcro, little teeth. What time is it? Oh, we're doing well. <clears throat> so I fixed the inside layer on this side, the blanket and the sheet, and now I'm working on the bedspread on this side. And one of the things I want to demonstrate here is that this skin is being redraped under minimal amount of tension because we're not relying on the skin to give the result. We're relying on the inside layer. And if you put too much tension on the skin, on the bedspread, bloop, you can create a very unnatural result. Closer. Eleven. Person. All right, four This incision in behind the ear is precisely placed along the junction of the hair and the skin of the neck. So when it heals, it will not distort her hairline. So she will be able to wear her hair in a ponytail or up. as she wishes. Can you go closer to the incision? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Gloria also has some um, pre-existing uh, acne scarring, which has improved over time with uh, modalities that she's used, but same fabric, like I mentioned. 
one of the things surgery will do is when the skin is loose, those acne scars tend to be more visible. So as we tighten the skin, the appearance of those acne scars will improve. Another four. So her complexion will look better. Two Kellys next. No flat marker. So Don wants to know, when performing a procedure, have you encountered another medical issue that wasn't apparent during the con consultation or pre-surgery that is not cosmetic in nature, i.e. like other health factors, maybe skin cancer? Mm. Um, I personally have not. Um, you know, there are occasional situations where when you're in, I shouldn't say that, there are situations when you're doing procedures where you may find something uh, like a growth or something like that, either inside or outside, hold this one, uh, that we want to deal with and tailor and biopsy if need be. More commonly, what's hap what happens in our practice is, and we've had this, look a second, we've had this happen multiple times, where uh, we send our patients for pre-surgical testing routinely before they have whatever we're gonna do, typically. And um, flat marker. And um, <clears throat> periodically we'll send somebody and they'll come up with an abnormal EKG. Or patients having a breast operation and they'll come up with an abnormal mammogram. And so we have found breast cancers during a preoperative evaluation for a cosmetic breast surgery, which obviously didn't happen because the patient's breast cancer needs to be taken care of. Uh, and we've had situations where, <clears throat> for, for, where we'll find an abnormal EKG, and a patient will go and have their cardiologist have a cardiologist do a workup, and find that they have some sort of coronary artery disease, which they didn't know they had, uh, and then that gets taken care of, or even diagnosis of things like diabetes can sometimes be found on pretesting. So. Uh, Sometimes when somebody's having an elective procedure, that procedure gets postponed or doesn't happen uh, because we've discovered a health issue, um, if that makes sense. Pat wants to know if um, droopy eyelids are covered by insurance if it affects your peripheral vision. Take that off. In general, the answer to that is no, but it also depends on it depends on the insurance carrier. Um, some insurance carriers, if you have a true functional deficit, blue. Cool. Hold the hair here. You know, most people just have baggy upper eyelids. Um, it's very uncommon to have a true functional deficit from an upper eyelid. But there's also something called ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S, 11, which is a... Um, weakening of the muscle of the upper eyelid, which can cause some droopiness of the upper eyelid. So peripheral field loss and ptosis uh, are something that can sometimes be addressed on an individual basis. In general, most eyelid surgery is pretty straightforward cosmetic. How often do you have patients who come in? Four. Um, with unrealistic requests or ideas of what they want to look like 
you know, somebody brings in a picture of Jennifer Aniston and says, I want to look like her. And, and what do you tell them? Um, unrealistic, hold this here. We have the bow before. So unrealistic expectations are. Yeah, let go, let go. Hang on one sec. Huh? Unrealistic expectations are pretty uncommon for a hold here, uh, but they do happen. And you know, my job is to educate the patient as to what's realistic and what's not realistic. And uh, you know, sometimes uh, patients aren't a candidate for anything because of their unrealistic expectations. Um, you know, the the. Uh, the Hollywood, uh, can you make me look like, uh, I can't think there was a movie that they did that, Face Off, I think it was called or something, with John Travolta, where they tried to make somebody look like somebody different. Uh, you know, those are uh, unrealistic in terms of commonplace daily cosmetic surgeries. Blue. So right now what we're doing is we're, we're um, tailoring the bedspread, we're removing the excess tissue, and double hook. Curves. Five of Icon. Now this all has to be done very precisely. If you put these things together precisely, these incisions, they will heal almost undetectable. So it's like putting the piece of a puzzle together. If you put the puzzle pieces together properly, then you can see the, the puzzle. But if you don't put them together properly, then you don't see the puzzle result. You know, the internet, um, as we all know, is a double-edged sword. Um, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of good information, and there's a lot of bad information, and a lot of misinformation. So, while I think it's a good idea to do your homework, really the best thing you can do is get a consultation if you have, if there's something you're considering and realize that face-to-face -face discussion with a surgeon is way better than the internet, ultimately. And then that doctor, he or she, can give you an honest assessment of um, <clears throat> what you need to have done or what you want to have done and what's realistically achievable. Donna wants to know, she says, um, if this procedure is reducing her acne scarring, will it also reduce large pores near her cheek area? Uh, to some degree, the quality of her overall skin will, will, we don't change the quality of the skin, but it will tend to look better. And then afterwards, when she's all healed, she'll get herself back on a good skincare regimen uh, to help maintain what we've done and help prevent further aging changes. Curves. So we're very precisely tailoring the tissue around her ear. You know, when I'm doing these procedures, there's this inside excitement that goes on as I'm sculpting because I can see 
looking at this, what a lovely result this lady is going to get and how nice she's going to look. And again, no braggadocious, I can just see it. You know, we're sculpting. And you can see how the sculpting is affecting how she looks, even right here in front of us. That's one of the fun parts of what we do as plastic surgeons. So and, you know, we uh, really enhance lives in many nice ways. Lin for five oh. Linda just commented on our WKYC Facebook page. Um, she wants to know how much discomfort should a patient expect and for how long? Okay, uh, very good question. Um, how much discomfort? Facial surgery in general does not carry with it a lot of discomfort in most cases. Most patients who have facial surgery, if they need pain medication, it may be for 24, 48, 72 hours, but usually by the second or third day after surgery, patients are either not needing any medication at all, or maybe even take something mild like an extra drink Tylenol. Uh, we do give patients a mild uh, narcotic pain medication, uh, just a few pills, short, short, it's inside. Mm -hmm. um, and that usually is all somebody needs for the first two or three days. Uh, beyond that, as they go through the healing process, uh, maybe a little uncomfortable when you touch yourself or bang yourself for a little while. But in terms of actual acute post-surgical pain, it's usually not as bad as pe Many, many people say to me, I don't know what I was worried about. This wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Now, that doesn't mean that every once in a while somebody has a more difficult experience than they expected. But that's the exception. The rule is <clears throat> most people are surprised and do well. What's the most painful plastic surgery that you, you might perform? Um, I would say probably the most uncomfortable procedure is a tummy tuck. Um, but we do things to help minimize the pain with a tummy tuck that we didn't used to know how to do. Uh, we very rarely use a drain. Most commonly we do what we call a drainless tummy tuck, a wound drain, uh, and that helps minimize the pain. And we also inject, even though the patient has general anesthesia, we inject a supplement of a local anesthesia inside where we've done the repair of the muscle, the tummy tuck, and the skin tissue of the tummy tuck and so forth. But just like here, we supplemented her general anesthesia with a local anesthesia, which will make her post-operative course um, a little more comfortable for her. <clears throat> Curve. So I know when I talked to um, Gloria prior to surgery, she had just gone on vacation and she took great care not to get any sun on her face or on her neck. Um, she had gone somewhere south. And uh, we have a question here. What is the skin regimen after surgery? Do you recommend a good moisturizer, sunscreen, mm -hmm. age-defying serum? Mm -hmm. What does the regimen consist of? Right. Uh, the initial regimen after surgery for the first four weeks is one week of non-perfume type moisturizer and then uh, continuing those 24-7 uh, and continuing with those products for about three or four weeks. About a month after surgery, we have you start using a scar reduction product on the actual incisions themselves. And then we start you on a good skincare regimen uh, post-operatively, <clears throat> such as um, proper skin uh, treatment, sometimes in the form of uh, peels, uh, uh, microdermabrasions, micropeeling, hydrofacials, really kind of depending on what the patient needs. Uh, it's very important to not have, you know, the sun is not our friend. It's our friend, but it's not our friend, I guess. Hold the uh, earlobe up. So as long as a patient has a bruise, curve, wherever the bruise, whether it's on a face or whether it's on an abdomen or whether it's on a breast, you should keep that bruised area out of direct sunlight until the bruise resolves. 
what will happen with them is if you sun expose a bruise, that discoloration earlobe <clears throat> will go from black and blue to brown. And so people can get some brownish discoloration in the area where the bruise was. And that's the blood pigment being affected by the sun. Okay, let go. Uh, short plane. <clears throat> Interrupted is fine. So sunscreen is very important. The other thing, if you sun expose your incisions to the sun too early, they will have prolonged redness. I have the bucket over here, Deb. <clears throat> So sunscreen is very important. For the first month, boy, no direct sunlight. Once the bruises are gone, cautious with sunlight. Now, once you're totally healed, you know, you can expose to the sun with proper sunscreen, you know, kind of as you wish. But sun over time, accelerates excessive sun over time, chronic over and over and over sun abuse can accelerate the aging process. So just as smoking can. <clears throat> I mean, I can look across the room and tell if somebody's a smoker or a sun person just by the quality of their skin. And the doctor's office, we handhold everybody through the whole post-operative course. So I see you often during the first month so that we have the ability to track your progress. And then as you progress, then we can give you the green light to do things such as skin care, makeup, that sort of thing. In general, you stay away from makeup for about two weeks after surgery until the incisions are on their way to healing, at least on the incisions. <clears throat> Makeup on a non-incision area can happen earlier than that. Let me have a toothpick blue. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? He's talking to you guys. <laughs> yeah, are you guys okay? You hanging in there? Hold this up here. We're not used to having this amount of visitors, curb scissors. It's usually just us chickens here working away, so <laughs> it's nice having somebody visit. You know, we're, we're getting some questions. A lady commented on our WKYC that she, she doesn't think this is newsworthy, and you and I talked about the educational value. Can you talk about why we're doing this? Sure. Um, well, everybody has an elect opinion about elective cosmetic surgery, but whether it's newsworthy or not, obviously, is a personal opinion. But people by the thousands and tens of thousands are having elective cosmetic operations done by properly trained people in proper environments. These can be fibrovical, can be really good, safe procedures yielding really good results. So the newsworthy of this, newsworthiness of this really applies to someone who's interested in perhaps having a cosmetic surgery procedure. Hold this up for me. Um, and wants to know the answers to a lot of the questions that we're, we're approaching. So while it may not be newsworthy to the person that's asking about it, that doesn't mean it's not newsworthy to tens of thousands of other people who are fascinated by this and interested and considering to becoming a cosmetic surgery patient themselves. And when they just do that, I want them to fall into the right hands and get the best possible results. So this is newsworthy to the people that it's newsworthy for. Do you but that doesn't discount the importance of what we're saying. Do you find that, um, you know, 17.7 million Americans underwent some type of cosmetic procedure uh, in 2018, and it seems that that number is going up. Why do you think that is? 
Well, I think the number of cosmetic procedures is going up for lots of reasons. Um, of course, the number of non-surgical procedures is, is increased because um, of the appeal of that. But I think it's going up for several reasons. I think one of them is we have procedures available that we didn't used to have. You know, I've been in practice 38 years, and I can tell you what we do now is way different than what I did when I was in training and what I learned when I was in training. Just like everything else that advances in life, take a car. A car from 30 years ago is not as sophisticated as the car today. It's the same thing with surgical techniques. Over the years, our surgical techniques have improved significantly. You know, better suture material, better anesthesia, better understanding of the anatomy of what we're doing, better ability to deliver a more natural result. Um, Plus, people are living longer, uh, fully explained, healthier, and people want to look good. You know, why do weight loss clinics survive? Why do fitness clinics survive? Hold this for me. Why do dentists deal with cosmetic dentistry? Um, you know, there are people who think, oh, this is all superficial, yada, yada, yada. But whether you like it or not, how you look, people judge you by how you look. Doesn't mean it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is what happens. So if you can put your best foot forward, especially in the workplace, you know, the competitive work market, you know, the, 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 the younger grads are out there and, you know, the older grad is like, oh, I got these young people to deal with. Technology has brought more younger people into the workplace. So the older population wants to compete in that workplace. And how do they compete? By looking the best they can look. And um, there is a lot of prejudice against the way people look. And I think it's sad, but it, it's the way it is. If somebody is massively overweight, what do most people, what goes through their mind? Why is somebody so heavy? They eat too much. They look lazy. They must not be very smart. These kinds of things. Old people, older people, tend to get prejudiced by younger people. So you're in the line in a grocery store and you're 80 years old and there's a 20-something behind you in line and they may say something or judge you because you're older. Um, People are judged by the color of their skin, and it's terrible what the world does to judge people. But I think in some small way, as a plastic surgeon, if we can contribute to helping that in whatever capacity, whether it's in the workforce, whether it's just somebody just feeling better about how they look, uh, I think that's great. How important is it for someone who may be considering plastic surgery to understand you know, they need to do this for themselves, not because someone else, you know, like for a woman, maybe says, you're flat-chested, you, you should go get implants, or, um, you know, you, you have a waddle neck, go get your neck, neck fixed. How important is it for someone to, you know, they, don't, they shouldn't do this for anybody else but themselves? Absolutely. These procedures are self-improvement procedures. If somebody else benefits, or excuse me, if somebody else likes how you look after you've done the procedure, that's great. But you're doing these procedures for yourself, and that's the prime mover. Uh, if a patient shows up in my office um, <clears throat> and brings their significant other with them, and the significant other wants the procedure, but the patient doesn't want the procedure, well, not such a good idea. I'm not going to force a procedure on somebody who doesn't want to do it. These have to come from within the individual. And uh, that's a very good point. It's very important. And that ra that's wrapped up in realistic expectations, too. <clears throat> do you often have people who come in um, who, uh, you know, maybe 
Speaking of unrealistic goals, maybe the uh, the implants they want maybe too large for their frame. Like, how do you counsel somebody when they're choosing, you know, especially when it comes to implants? Yeah, breast implants. Uh, there's a science behind breast implant sizes based on uh, the base diameter of the breast, the width of the chest, the thickness of the pre-existing breast tissue, i.e. customized to the patient's anatomy. Unfortunately, that science often gets thrown out the window by the patient population. And uh, sometimes patients end up requesting or not allowing the surgeon to make the proper recommendation, but directs the surgeon what to do. And with that particular operation, complications increase when people try to do, try to put an implant in that's not proper for their size. Trying to put a size 10 foot in a size 6 shoe doesn't work. Same thing with the breasts. And so that's a matter of education and counseling. Now in our community, the majority of patients who have breast implants are realistic with their expectations. Not all, but the majority. There are parts of the country, however, where patients are not realistic with their requests for breast implant sizes. And that is one of the most common things you see on that bot show is issues with breast implants. I'll just forward. So we are now just over two hours into surgery. If you are just tuning in with us, uh, you are watching Dr. Michael Watnowski at Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery perform a neck lift and a lower face lift on a patient who is well aware that we are in the operating room with her. Um, if you have any questions for the doctor, he's answering them live. Just tweet me at Monica Robbins or go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins in parentheses WKYC. And I've, uh, I've pinned a couple of t uh, tweet and a comment section that you can comment, ask your question, or just send me a message and he will answer your questions live. This has been incredibly informative. Even for someone like me who's been in dozens of surgeries, um, just witnessing this and how things have changed over the years. So uh, again, if you have any questions whatsoever, you can watch this on WKYC.com. You probably are, that's why you're listening to me. Or of course, um, on uh, our YouTube WKYC page. And for those of you who've asked me, um, this will be archived on our YouTube page. Uh, so if you missed it or you want to come back to it later, you can always go to our WKYC YouTube and that's where you will be able to see the entire procedure. Doctor, how much time do you anticipate we have left? Um, we're two thirds of the way for the procedure. So what I'm going to do after I finish this side is I'm going to inject the local anesthesia on the other side. That needs to work about 10 minutes before we start the procedure. So take a little short break during that period. And then after the local anesthesia kicks in, then we'll do the uh, last side. So uh, probably an hour, maybe, a little more. So we have a question. Um, how much sleep do you get the night before surgery? Because <laughs> it seems you've been sitting here for almost two hours. It'll be another hour. It's kind of grueling. I'm a cheap date. <laughs> uh, when I have a, a, a surgical procedure the next day, uh, I'm always in bed because I usually get up at 5 o'clock and in the office by 6, 6.30. So I always go to bed by about 9 o'clock on a surgery night. Uh, being rested is, is really important. Uh, you know, you're up to bat the entire time you're doing a surgical procedure. You're right on there on home plate. And so you want to be at your best. Uh, you know, you can't go out till three in the morning, the night before surgery. Nor should there be alcohol consumption the night before surgery, in my opinion. 
Um, you know, patients who, I need another five all. <clears throat> patients who give you the, you know, express the confidence to allow you to do a procedure, a life-changing procedure, um, there's no other way to do this but the right way. Double hook. <clears throat> Double hook. Um, and to try to shortcut, um, right. just, that's just not how I practice or how I function, nor should anybody. Um, people have to trust you. And um, so you're always flattered when a patient elects to allow you to do their surgery. But you have to deliver on that. And trust is of utmost importance. That's a very good question, though. So uh, we have a couple of new viewers who are just tuning in. Um, Carol wants to know, she, uh, she just tuned in, so she missed the price range of this exact procedure. Um, and she says you're very knowledgeable. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, fees for surgical procedures uh, vary depending on the extent of the procedures. Facial surgery procedures, you know, surgeon's fees um, start, you know, four or five thousand dollars to, you know, many, many thousands of dollars. But there are lots of fees involved with surgery. Um, cost of the operating room, cost of the staff, cost of anesthesia, cost of the drugs, cost of supplies. So there are many layers to a fee besides just the surgeon's fee. And so all that's discussed in detail with the patient uh, based on their anatomy. You know, uh, some people's anatomy is pretty straightforward um, and uh, allows the procedure to take less time. You know, there are some people who have um, a bigger head. For instance, a man, males. Uh, males take longer to do than females because uh, of the size of their head, if nothing else. Uh, bigger surface area. Um, there are certain people that have very complex necks. Uh, so the amount of work we have to do in the neck on that person is formally more, more than we did on Gloria. Uh, she had a nice, very delicate neck and uh, so forth. So um, a facelift is not a facelift is not a facelift, um, if that makes any sense. Suzanne wants to know, this is interesting, she says uh, she had a facelift three months ago and she says her neck is lumpy. The doctor says she's reacting to the permanent sutures. Is there anything she can do to help it? Well, without knowing exactly um, what was done and what type of suture material was, done, was used, uh, most of the time if you have lumps and bumps uh, in an area where you've had surgery, they usually may not go away 100%, but they tend to dissipate with time. And uh, time, is, time is our friend with the healing process. Um, if the sutures after a, after a certain period of time, if those lumps and bumps are persistent and there's still an issue, and then sometimes a little secondary surgery may be in order to correct that. But that's not common. Uh, everybody wants to be healed like they got their hair cut, and that would be great, but sometimes healing is longer than we want it to be. But um, if there's a, something that's healed cosmetically unacceptable, usually that can be after an adequate period of time. You have to let Mother Nature do her thing first, uh, but after an adequate period of time, a possible intervention may be able to make it better. So every, and everyone heals differently, right? So yeah. I, even though it's been three months for her, it's, it's not, is it unreasonable to expect um, her, she to be fully healed by now or is just everybody different? Everybody's different. Um, the surgeon and the patient cannot control the healing process uh, and the speed of the healing process is different in different people. Cut this better in the intro. Um, so, while some people might look 
pretty darn good in two weeks. Uh, other people may take six, eight months before they get to that point. Uh, there should be gradual improvement over time, however. So Leo is just tuning in as well, and um, like so many others, and we answered this in our first hour, but we'll ask again, does insurance cover the cost? No, facial cosmetic surgery is, is elective surgery, <clears throat> and it's not a... There it is. Let's talk about men. Um, mm -hmm. I know, I, I think it was 1.3 million men had underwent some type of cosmetic procedure in uh, 2017, and that Which number is, is going <clears throat> up relating to mm -hmm. men. A lot of men are getting um, non-cosmetic or non-surgical cosmetic procedures such as Botox, especially like those, you know, like you were talking about those, um, turn the head those CEO type guys who, uh, you know, they call it the executive edge. Um, what percentage of your clientele are men? Um, I would say probably about 20%. Um, men, maybe even 30. Um, men fall into two categories, body contouring, liposuction, one of the most common things we do on men. And then the second thing is facial rejuvenation. Uh, facelifts and eyelids are very common surgery in men. We're going to turn the head here. Um, we're all done one side. Now we're going to tackle the other. Marking pen and a table. <clears throat> you know, men um, have the same issues workforce issues, looking their best issues. And, uh, you know, if a cosmetic surgery enhancement can, can help that, so be it. One of the um, other more common procedures that men are getting. Um, other, you know, liposuction, number one. Number two is eyelid surgery. Number three is facial surgery. And then uh, falling into line with that, uh, rhinoplasties, nose jobs, uh, sometime. Um, every once in a while, a male will have a tummy tuck. Usually that's a bariatric patient, a man who's lost a lot of weight. Uh, you know, tummy tucks more commonly in women are done for postpartum situations, uh, but sometimes weight loss as well. <clears throat> Short needle. What about breast reduction for men? Uh, yeah, that actually falls under liposuction, but that's a very common, good, good question. That's a very common procedure. Um, male breast en enlargement can be congenital, puberty, called gynecomastia, but it can also be uh, acquired. It's acquired by weight. I, if you're overweight, you can get fatty breasts. It can be acquired as a secondary side effect of certain medications. So some men, as they get older, uh, have to take certain testosterone or prost prostate medications. Sometimes a side effect of that is um, male breast enlargement. More commonly, is just weight. And um, one of the most common areas we do liposuction on, short, uh, is male breast. Men also, probably the most common area men do is their love handles and then tummies short this is 20. 20. i have a question about breast reductions in 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 women uh -huh. um are they depending is if there's a medical issue connected to it would it be covered by insurance uh it depends on the amount of breast reduction tissue Insurance companies used to be um, pretty lax with their coverage of breast reduction for women, uh, but nowadays um, they tend to not be as uh, relaxed with that. And so it's very often uh, determined by the amount of breast tissue that one is going to have removed. And different insurance companies have different criteria for that. Uh, you know, so some women, when they have a breast reduction, it's a, a mild breast, mild sized breast reduction, which would not fun, fall under the auspices of third party coverage. Uh, 
uh, sometimes what we call a small breast reduction or a breast lift procedure. Short. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one for you. What is the best procedure for deep frown lines between the eyebrows? Well, the, the home run non-surgical treatment for that is Botox. <clears throat> Those frown lines, they call them the 11s, those are due to activity of there's three muscles between the eyebrows called the corrugator muscles and the procerus muscle. Procerus is in the center, corrugator is off to the side. And those muscles, for some reason, tend to get more active as people get older. And sometimes young people have hyperactive muscles in those areas. But the anatomical function of those muscles is to pull the eyebrow down and inward. So when those muscles contract over and over and over and over over the years, what happens is your eyebrow position starts to drop in between the eyebrows. And you'll start to get some creases or marks in the skin. So let's take a piece of paper. If you fold a piece of paper over one time, you get a certain crease. If you fold it over and over and over and over, you start to get a weak spot in that paper. Another one. Um, that's what happens with the frown line. That muscle contracts over and over and over and over and over. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually, those frown lines become etched in place due to muscle activity. So what Botox does is it is put in in little micro, micro droplets, and it weakens the ability of those three muscles to function. And consequently, you'll get a weakening, lessening of the appearance of those frown lines. Botox takes effect about three to seven days after it's injected, and it lasts about three to four months in general. Now, some people put filler in those frown lines, but filler tends to not work as well as Botox in that part of the face because if you don't weaken the muscles and you put filler in, those muscles contracting will squeeze the filler out of place like toothpaste does in a tube when you squeeze it. So the upper face, those frown line muscles, is best treated with Botox. Now, if you have a surgical procedure, which is called a brow lift, spinal, and this is 50, right? Correct. Same as the other. Did I put the spinal in the other? Yes. I've been doing that. I'm talking so much. I don't remember what I did. Um, when you do a brow lift, one of the steps of the brow lift is to actually approach those three muscles and reduce their bulk. We actually take out some of the extra, what we call hypertrophic or overgrown muscles. And that will either permanently or long term improve those lines and can sometimes obviate the need for Botox. Secondarily, if you do an upper eyelid tuck as an isolated procedure and you have those frown lines, sometimes you can access those muscles through the upper eyelid and reduce the bulk of those muscles through the upper eyelid if you don't need or you're not also doing a brow lift. So, um, you know, it's like a road map to get from this city to this city. There are different ways. You can fly there, you can take a train, take a car. Same thing with all the things we do. There are different ways to get to a destination. <clears throat> um, and they're customized to the patient's anatomy and also um, vary depending on what the patients want. You know, there, there, there are patients who say, you know what, I don't want to do this 
repetition process. I want to come in here, I want to do something. I don't want to come in here every three, four months and do something. So those patients will come in ointment. <clears throat> those patients will elect to do surgery. Other people are like, yeah, I don't know, I'm not really ready for surgery. So, and then there's other people who are like, I don't want to do this stuff. I'm just going to dive in and do an operation. And there are other people who are like, no, let's do some Botox for a while. Many, many patients who have non-surgical treatments, not all, but many, ultimately become a surgical patient. Have a towel. I'm debating whether I should take a break or not. Have you ever had to refuse a patient? Oh, yeah. Do it nicely. Typically, why, why would you? Uh, more commonly, um, I'm going to take a short break. So, uh, more commonly, while this medication works, I'm going to go take a quick break and I'll be back. Uh, more commonly, refusal uh, has to do with uh, unrealistic expectations, which we talked about. Um, general health, if somebody's in really bad health, they're extremely heavy smoker, they have other medical issues that could impair or impede healing, those people sometimes just to say, you know, surgery is not for you. Now, that particular category of patient, non-surgery is a good thing for them because maybe they can do something without the risk. So, so I will be back in about five minutes. We're going to let this medicine work. Okay. Okay. We're going to take your microphone off of right. you. So, um, I'll just turn it off. Uh, yeah. You want to flip around? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I'll glove up here. No, I can do it. I'll do it. We'll just, uh, here, you can leave it hooked there. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're, we're, shutting, we're shutting off the doctor's microphone so we don't hear anything about that we shouldn't hear relating to other patients. But um, while we're waiting for him to return, in case you are just tuning in, I am uh, Channel 3 Senior Health Correspondent Monica Robbins. We are live in the OR. What you're watching is a live surgery of Dr. Gloria Roman. She is having a uh, neck lift and a lower face lift. Um, some of the things, many questions you guys have had, they've been phenomenal. He's been answering all of them that we've been getting. If you have questions, tweet them to me at Monica Robbins, or you can go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins in parentheses WKYC, and comment on the post I have there, and I will ask your questions to him. Um, you can also go to our WKYC Facebook page. We have a link there. You can uh, click on it. Obviously, you're either watching on our YouTube channel, WKYC, or you're watching on WKYC.com. Um, we appreciate you for tuning in. We hope this is an educational experience for you because most people never get the opportunity to watch a surgery or, you know, I hope you feel like I'm bringing you into the OR so you have this opportunity to see what we're doing in here. This, is, uh, this was something we kind of conceived. We thought it would be a good idea, a, an educational opportunity. Um, this is hopefully not going to be the last procedure we take you into. We're, uh, we're going to make this a series in the future. So we want you to stay tuned. We want you to keep watching. And if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see, let me know. Um, Dr. Witnowski has graciously invited us back to see another procedure. We're not sure what that's going to be yet. So if there's something specific you would like to see, tweet me at Monica Robbins or on my Facebook page, send me a message, Monica Robbins in parentheses WKYC. We would love to hear from you. We also want to hear from you about, you know, he's answering a number of your questions. Have, have you, you know, has this given you any insight? Because a lot of people may be considering plastic surgery, but maybe there's some myths and misconceptions you've had about what really goes on in this room. So we hope we're dispelling some of those. We're going to just kind of stay tuned here. So stand by if uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes when the doctor comes back.
Don't you have a pair? And huge thanks for his staff for putting oh. up with us while we're in here. So uh, am I back on? Yep, okay. I think you are. Okay, we're getting ready to start the third part. We finished the neck, which was part number one. We finished the whole left cheek and neck. Uh, and now we're going to do the right cheek and neck. Gloria's going to get a great result. So I, I'm curious from, from your staff, what are some of the most common questions you guys get from patients? Um, well, this staff right here doesn't work in the office with me. Ah, okay. So they get to be around people who sleep all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so they can't really answer those questions. But, uh, but you know, people uh, will sometimes ask staff things they won't ask me. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples. But uh, l let my mind work here a minute, and maybe I'll come up with something. Fifteen? So I have, I have a message from one of your patients who says you're wonderful, and you recently did her surgery. Oh, She's very glad to see this. Uh, I'm just going to call her Catherine. We're not going to say anything else about her. And then um, I had another couple of questions from people. These, these, thank goodness we're doing this online because these are some sensitive questions um, from people. And uh, one, one of the issues was um, penile implants are becoming more common and more popular in um, uh, Los Angeles and I, I believe here, but is that necessarily something that would be done by a plastic surgeon? Um, no, certainly not something I do, but uh, that sort of surgery falls under the two hook, falls under the range of either a urologist or a plastic, no, a mosquito, or a plastic surgeon. And uh, I can't address too much other than that. Okay. Um, what about, uh, you know, some women have, been, you know, we see all these plastic surgery shows on uh, TLC and other, you know, um, shows that are out there, labia surgery or labia mm -hmm. reconstruction. Is that mm -hmm. something that's, you know, commonly done? Uh, gender, uh, again, not, not in our practice, but in the practice of some plastic surgeons and uh, urologists and uh, OBGYN, uh, what we call uh, <clears throat> female rejuvenation uh, is becoming more and more common. Um, there are some non-surgical uh, machines on the market which do some uh, tightening of those areas and then uh, there are surgical treatments uh, for uh, uh, vaginal uh, adjustment as well. Uh, certain parts of the anatomy tend to grow as you get older. Uh, same thing happens in men sometimes with their uh, body parts, things you don't want to grow, grow. So sometimes in a female, the, the labia, and sometimes in the male, even the scrotal area can become excessively large. Take those out and keep them. So we have another question from a viewer. Any specific yeah. diet or restrictions after this procedure? Hang on one second. Welcome. Double hook. Um, after the procedure, usually the first week or so, it's a good idea to kind of restrict yourself to uh, liquids and soft foods, uh, things that you don't have to work too hard to chew. Mosquito. But really no, no specific restriction, but you, know, you wouldn't want to try to put a piece of fried chicken or a Big Mac in your mouth when you're going through the initial healing. Browns and blade. I would assume it's going to be pretty tender too. It's not so. really as tender as much as it's tight. Um, and uh, you know, you try to uh, open your mouth a little wider than it's ready to be open initially. Uh, not so much it hurts, it's just, um, it, it's just tight. You know, it's a use your judgment as well. And we, go, we handle three people through all these details, but but uh, people have to use common sense as well. You know, don't get on a ladder and clean your garage the next day. <laughs> use some common sense. You just had surgery. Yeah. Mm. 
you know, I want to mention that, that if, if uh, we don't get everybody's questions answered, they're certainly welcome to call the office at any point, and one of the staff members can answer any questions that maybe we missed along the way. But we still have some time, so oh, yeah. fire away. So we had a viewer call into our newsroom, and she wants to know, what do you think about facial exercises? Can that help tighten the face over time? She recently lost weight and wants to tighten up her facial skin. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no scientific evidence that facial exercises really do very much. And uh, it has to do with the type of muscle, you know, um, a skeletal muscle, double hook and uh, straights, a skeletal muscle, which is the muscle like in your biceps and your triceps and so forth, your pecs, those muscles respond to exercise, to movement, to stress. But certain muscles in the body don't. For instance, facial muscles tend to not respond. The heart, the heart is a muscle, but it doesn't tend to grow as you use it. And, you know, think about what would happen if your heart or your facial muscle would grow from use. Well, you know, those muscles go all day, every day. So, the, the, you know, when the body was designed, uh, uh, it wasn't designed for those muscles to respond to exercise. I know that there are all sorts of gadgets on the market that are supposed to tighten faces and so forth. I, I don't know that there's any science behind any of that stuff, but that's just my opinion. I don't have any knowledge, direct knowledge or experience. Let's talk a little bit about anesthesia. You know, obviously, um, Gloria is out, and we have your anesthesiologist behind you. Um, what's unique about this setup? And doctor, feel free, jump in. He won't be able, we won't be able to hear you. You're not mic'd, uh, but he can, he can reference. How do you mean unique? Um, well, I understand that this is basically the same anesthesi anesthesiology setup that you would find in any other hospital. Of course, right. right. You follow the same, same guidelines. Standard of, yeah. standard. standard of care, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Difference is, you know, this is a, an outpatient, this is an ASC, uh, you know, an outpatient surgical center. And, you know, uh, all ASCs, when they do anesthesia, do the same kind of general anesthesia. And the type of general anesthesia is, and, and depth and so forth is dictated by what procedure we're doing, how long the procedure is. So, so just like the surgery is tailored to the patient's anatomy, Dr. Shah and anesthesia tailor the uh, surgical, excuse me, tailor the anesthesia to the case. Different anesthesia if it's going to be a one hour case versus if it's going to be a four hour case. Uh, different anesthesia if we need to really keep the blood pressure under control, like which we do with, with facial surgery. So customized just like uh, the surgery is. If that, does that make sense? <clears throat> Patient safety being number one, which I mentioned earlier. This is above it. Because my a lot of places they do like face lids, but they do a local anesthesia, and they don't necessarily tell the patient right or Right, not as monitored as well as we want them to be. Right. Yeah, you know we're very. Uh, we're very honest and upfront with patients. Uh, no reason not to be, but we want 15. We want a patient to have the best experience possible. <clears throat> Deb, just the lights, please. And the safest experience possible. So.
So the And same thing when the patient wakes up from anesthesia, <clears throat> they will go to the recovery area and they'll go through the standard protocol that a patient goes through recovering from any anesthesia, <clears throat> whether it's an in-hospital procedure. And of course, these days, a large amount of surgery is done in an outpatient setting, even at hospital surgery centers and so forth. A lot of surgical procedures. Two doubles. All right, um, mosquito. <clears throat> Bobby. So um, another viewer wants to know, is, are you cutting the excessive skin off around her ears? Yeah, we, did, we, we will do that on this side. We did it on the other side already. Uh, once we fix the inside layers, the fat and the muscle, they're called smass of the face, the inner layer of the face, then we tailor the outer layer, the bed spread or the skin, and then remove the excess. But again, it's not the amount of skin remove that we remove and how tight we make that skin that creates the ultimate result. The ultimate result, the ultimate result is very much affected by that inner layer work that we do. Straights. Dr. Shaw, raise the table, please. Cab, dust, <clears throat> front and back lights. <clears throat> right there. Okay, that's good. Go down just a little, I'm sorry. Let's see if we can get this light here. Right, that's good. Right there. Perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, the other advantage of um, <clears throat> what we do here is that we have a <clears throat> consistent focused staff. So I work with the same people over and over and over, doing the same cases over and over and over. And that really, really just allows for a better experience for everybody. Sometimes in a larger setting, especially like a hospital, you don't always have, you the surgeon, don't always have the same staff all the time. So one day you may have Mary Jones in the circulating and the next day Mary Smith. And that doesn't discount Mary Jones or Mary Smith's ability, but it's so much more comfortable for everybody, doctor, staff, and better for the patient if you have people that do things on an ongoing, regular basis. So they're familiar with your routine. And I think you can see from Kelly and DeAndre, there's not a lot of conversation that goes on here because they've done these cases over and over and over and they pretty much know exactly what I need next. They know the steps of the procedure, they know what I do and uh, that makes it makes this case go faster, more streamlined, and just really allows me to do a better job. So Mike wants to know, um, he says he plans on a facelift in a few years. He wants to know, when do you plan on retiring? And do you have a partner in your practice in case you're not available or out of town? Uh, from a coverage point of view, I have several plastic surgeons that cover when, when I'm not around and so forth. Uh, I'm not planning on retiring. 
anytime soon. <laughs> so, so, uh, so Mike, you're good. You might just want to yeah. re reevaluate your plan. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going anywhere. When, when is the right, like, when should somebody come in to see you for a consult for, you know, a facelift or any other procedure? Like, when do you know it's time to get that consult? Yeah, I think people know, um, it, it ultimately becomes people sort of relay this to me, but, you know, men will say, I stopped wearing a necktie because when I wear a tie, my neck hangs down over my collar. Women will say, I don't wear a turtleneck anymore because my neck is so loose. Um, and it's the patient who says, you know, God, I, every day I look in the mirror and I just, I focus on this every day. And people will come in and they'll make this motion with their hands, kind of duplicating what they think we're going to do when we do surgery. So, you know, the time is when it gets to the point where people are like, you know, I got to do something. I don't like the way I look. The other time people will notice, and I'll tell you, one of the things that's been a boon for plastic, facial plastic surgery are selfies. Um, people take selfies all the time, and they're like, God, do I look like that? Is that really how I look? Or pictures, photograph, as you know from being TV people, you know, photographs, uh, cameras add weight. They, uh, they change really how you look. You don't necessarily look exactly like that photo. But what they tend to do is they tend to accentuate the negative. So if somebody has a double chin and they take a selfie, that double chin is just sitting there. Wow, look at that double chin. So uh, modern technology has been, been good for us too in many ways because it's brought attention to things that we can fix and we can help and we can make people look better, like retractors. Yes, yeah, speaking of that technology, one of the things that surprised me is the number of millennials that are coming into plastic surgeon offices for, you know, initially the non uh, surgical procedure, but, um, you know, they're, they're oh, getting. They're very aware. Yeah. Uh, very, very aware. Need a mosquito. What's that? Double that? <clears throat> double hook back. Mosquito. Fix the light behind me, Jack, please. So where are we now in the process? All right, well, we're, we're uh, lifting the bedspread up on this side, uh, the skin, and we're getting into the inside layer, and this mass layer, which is a layer of fat and muscle that we're gonna adjust. And we're gonna be getting to do that in the next few seconds. Okay, let me have the, the light. And we're just doing what we call hemostasis, vascars. Lights off, please. Sponge. Sponge. I'm a heavy bubble. <clears throat> we're just getting the uh, bleeding under control. Let's watch your face, please. Lower the table, Dr. Shaw.
Hmm. Hmm. All right, a little tailoring back here. Put that in the ear. Pull the ear forward. Mm -hmm. So we're just getting what we call hemostasis, which means controlling any, any bleeding. <clears throat> and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to work on the sheet in the blanket or the inside of the face called the SMAS. And like I said, that's the very important part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. I'm going to change here and here. Okay, browns and Q-tip. Another pair of browns. <clears throat> and I'm just marking on the inside where I'm going to do my tailoring. Bloop. All right, Deb, turn the lights back on. Mm -hmm. So if you're just tuning in, uh, this is Senior Health Correspondent Monica Robbins. You are watching a live surgery at the Ohio Clinic for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery out here in Westlake. We're with Dr. Michael Witnowski, who is performing a uh, neck lift and lower face lift on Dr. Gloria mm -hmm. Roman. She is well aware we are in the uh, operating room with her. Mm -hmm. The okay. purpose of this is to educate you about um, plastic surgery. Maybe there are some myths mm -hmm. or misconceptions you may have, or maybe this is something you're considering and you want to know what really happens in the OR. Uh, Dr. Wynowski is also answering your questions live. So all you need to do is, if you have any questions, tweet me at Monica Robbins or go to my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC, Thrilled, and uh, comment on the post I put up and he will answer your questions. We're getting literally a wealth of information, not just about this particular procedure, but about plastic surgery in general, all types of topics. Um, pretty much nothing is taboo because this is you know online. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate. You can inbox me if, uh, if this is sensitive, and I, I, I won't use your name, obviously, so let me know what you uh, want to know, and uh, we'll continue going. So we have a maybe, we've been doing this now for, Perfect. we're at three hours at this point, and um, it's probably a it's good guesstimate, helpful. maybe another 45 minutes or so. So, um, you know, while you're watching, make sure if, if you have any questions, that that's what we're here I'm for. We're here to answer them. Soon. So we're just doing that inside tightening of the, what we call the SMAS layer. We did that on the other side. So we fixed the front part of the muscle, the turkey gobble muscle, through that little incision under the neck in the front. And now we're fixing the back part of that muscle through this incision. And what that does is it creates kind of almost like a hammock or a sling that goes all the way across the neck from side to side that improves the contour of the neck. So 
we have another question. Um, someone wants to know, will Gloria be uh, nauseous from the anesthesia? Uh, nausea is very uncommon after anesthesia. Certainly it does happen. Um, Dr. Shaw <laughs> gives multiple medications to help prevent nausea. And uh, uh, if a patient does have nausea afterwards, there are medications that can be given to help mitigate that. Uh, but we actually try to prevent that in the first place. And uh, Dr. Shaw is very conscious of that and does everything possible to help prevent the nausea. Nausea certainly can occur with any anesthesia, but the incidence of it is much less than it was in the past and with all the precautions that we take. What would you say is the most common misconception people have about plastic surgery? Common misconception? Um, Well, sometimes people think we use the term, we use plastic in the process. Uh, what does plastic come from? Well, plastic comes from a Greek word called plastikos, P-L-A-S-T-I-K-O-S. And plastikos means to mold, mend, or remodel. So that's where the name of the specialty comes from. So sometimes people who don't really know anything about what we do. They think we use some sort of material. What kind of plastic material do you use? So I think that's one, one misconception uh, that occurs. Um, I think uh, managing expectations is important. And what I mean by that is proper, you can go back down there, proper consultation, uh, communication to educate patients during their consultation to help dispel any myths that may exist. Three of like one now. And put a four all up here. Is this a full length? Okay. And then come up here to need a hole. The other thing is I think people, certainly with facial rejuvenation, people have to understand that there are limitations, well, there are limitations to what facial rejuvenation is going to do. Um, and so people have to have proper expectations. You know, you're not going to take a 60-year-old and make them look like a 20-year-old, but you are going to take a 60-year-old and make them look like a really good 60-year-old. and if you do that right, patients will get a nice natural looking result. It'll make a nice difference in how they look, but they won't look abnormal. <clears throat> Can you discuss the difference between um, saline and silicone breast implants and why one would be used over the other? Mm -hmm. Well, the type of implant that a patient selects ultimately is their decision. Uh, the two types of implants, saline filled and silicone gel filled. All implants have the same surface, which is a, a silicone envelope. Imagine a baggie. Uh, that baggie is then filled with different material. One material is saline or salt water, sterile salt water, and that is injected at the time of the procedure uh, to determine uh, implant size and volume change and so forth. And then gel implants are, are filled, same outside envelope, but they're filled with um, a silicone gel 
material which is of different density than the saline material. So which type of implant a patient elects is really uh, up to them. And that's, again, part of the education that goes on during the consultation, uh, providing the different discussion about the different options that are available in terms of implant types and so forth. Uh, there's no one implant that's perfect for anybody. And it's, it's, it's a decision made based on patient's anatomy, patient's goals, and so forth. The silicone implants that were taken off the market years ago, mm -hmm. are those, why are those still used? <clears throat> well, they're not. Uh, the silicone implants that were taken off the market are not used. Those implants were literally taken off the market. Um, there was some thought that there were potential medical issues from those implants, uh, and pretty much those uh, issues were dispelled over the years. And so in the United States, gel implants are back on the market. They've been back on the market in Europe and Canada and the rest of the world <coughs> long ago. Uh, the, um, is this yes. the, the newer implants are not the exact same type of implants that those old implants were. Um, again, just like everything else, Technology has improved. Implant materials have also improved. But they were taken off the market initially because of some um, fears that proved to be unfounded. Have you heard of this um, breast implant illness? Well, there was... There was um, Back, dating back to those implants, <clears throat> there was some allegations that those implants themselves contributed to, um, quote, illness, autoimmune, and so forth. <clears throat> and again, those, uh, those myths were pretty well dispelled. Um, And it's not to say somebody can't have a problem from a breast implant. Sometimes it's a wound problem. Sometimes it's how an individual reacts to the implants. What is the amount of swelling with this procedure and are ice packs needed? Um, swelling is maximum at 48 hours after surgery. Um, we give some medication during surgery, anesthesia does, to help minimize swelling. Postoperatively, we have the patient take a, medi a, a herbal medication called Arnica. Uh, Arnica is a herbal medication that helps minimize bruising and swelling. Everybody's going to get some, no matter what you do. Um, it's maximum, like I said, during the first 48 hours, and then it gradually relents as the days pass. Um, final contour, even though your contour looks pretty good pretty quickly, your result changes for weeks and weeks, up to three or four months after surgery. So that's why sometimes initially, when you're healing, you're like, you may not be quite where you think you want to be. And very often, things that may look a little distorted or a little abnormal initially are not due to abnormal healing, but just due to the healing process. And they tend to resolve on their own over time. Uh, once the bandage is removed, which is the next day, then we encourage ice compresses. And also, uh, it helps very much if people sleep initially the first week, either elevated, like in a recliner, or on a, on a couple of pillows, so that their back is elevated. And that also helps gravity minimize the swelling. First.
Yes, sir. I only have a double. <clears throat> Bobby? An interesting phenomenon has to do with healing in surgery street centers. Um, same surgeon, same suture, same operation on one side of the face or on one breast or on one side of the body. Healing is not exactly the same. It's almost like there are two different people, two different bodies. So one side of the face will heal more rapidly than the other. Not through any fault of anybody's, this is how it goes. Vascular and leg retractor. Bumpy with the right hand. Some people want a natural approach and some want a more noticeable look. What is the, how do you typically do surgery? Um, I tend to be um, more of a naturalist and I use this analogy, I mentioned this earlier, I don't think good, cosme, good facial cosmetic surgery should be detectable, frankly, by anybody. But if you're sitting in a restaurant and somebody walks in who you don't know and you can tell from a mile away they've had surgery. That's often surgery that's a little overzealous. And uh, it's not particularly attractive. Isn't that when we refer to bad surgery? <laughs> <laughs> well, one could say bad surgery, but you know, more commonly it's this, you know, stylized surgery. There are patients who, who uh, want to wear their facelift as a badge of honor and want the whole world to know they did it. Uh, that's not how we function here. Uh, but in general, that's not uh, a common request, nor a common goal, certainly by most plastic surgeons who do this sort of stuff on a regular basis. All right, let's see how that looks. Lights, please. <clears throat> Toothpick blue. So we've done the inside layer and the outside layer. Uh, excuse me, we did the outside layer and then we did the inside layer, so now we're going to tailor the bedspread, tailor the skin. Double hook. <clears throat> Four hole right. Four hole right. Oh, teeth. Is there anything Gloria has to do before she's able to leave the office today? Um, she will be in the recovery area for about an hour and a half. And uh, during that time, you know, we'll monitor her pulse and blood pressure, make sure that they're both under control because we don't want people to leave here with their blood pressure elevated because that could potentiate that hematoma we talked about or that internal bleeding. And the other thing is we want to make sure she goes to the bathroom, uh, urinates. And one of the side effects of anesthesia medications is retention, not peeing. So we want people to do that before they leave. But in general, her job is to, mark and pen, or blue, too thick one. Her job is to rest and relax and get better and we will see her I'll see her before she goes home but we'll see her in the office as well tomorrow and we will take her bandage off for her 11 um, we'll wash her hair for her for the first time and she'll go home without a bandage and curves 
So obviously somebody has to pick her up. Yeah, everybody needs, uh, needs a caretaker for the first 24 hours, ideally. It doesn't have to be a healthcare professional, but a friend or a family member. And we review with that person who picks them up, you know, what to do, comments, alert, things to worry about, things not to worry about. And uh, <clears throat> well, the, <clears throat> I'm available by phone all the time. For a bike. So if a patient has a question or an issue, we always tell patients there are no silly questions. I would rather somebody call with what they think is a silly question and me to be able to allay their anxieties. Or perhaps a question they thought was silly turns out not to be silly. So communication is very important. And op open door, you know, we want to hear from people. How long does uh, a breast implant typically last? Is that a surgery that you'd have to have redone? Um, there used to be an old wives tale that said every 10 years you have to get new implants. And it's pretty much an old wives tale. So what we tell people is, um, unless you're having a problem with the implant that requires us to do additional surgery for some reason, if it's five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, your implants are intact and you're not having any problems with them, there's uh, no need to do anything. Um, problems can be everything from non-problems to where a patient wants a size change. I want bigger or smaller implants. Uh, to sometimes abnormal scarring around an implant which can necessitate us having to go back and do some scar release and so forth. But in general, if there's no issue with the implant, then there's no reason to put a patient through a surgery unless they need to. Individual basis, everybody's different. Is there a new way um, that you're doing breast augmentation? Or do, do patients have options of different types of ways they may get it? Um, <clears throat> Well, breast augmentation surgery is pretty straightforward surgery. Um, implants are placed through a small incision, usually under the breast. I'll lower the table, Dr. Shaw. Um, the location of the implant, like where you put it inside the breast, <clears throat> just the lights, blue, um, can either be right behind the breast or what we call retro mammary are one layer deeper under the muscle, which is called submuscular. Uh, and that's, again, determined by patient's anatomy. Sponge. And uh, should be predetermined before surgery to some degree. All right, double hook. <clears throat> And what size implant you're going to put in? And that's determined by examination of the patient's anatomy <clears throat> and measurements that we take. Five volt vital. So right now we're just tailoring the bedspread, tailoring the skin, putting everything back together, the puzzle as I described it. And I can see that Gloria is going to get an amazing, outstanding result. How can you tell that? I can see what she's going to look like when she's all healed because there's no bruising and swelling. So bruising and swelling will distort things while they're going through the healing process. So I sort of get the 
see how people are going to look once they're all said and done. And it also, I make the judgment <coughs> when I'm doing this. Hey, Kelly. Mm. How tight to pull everything, where to put everything. Flat mark. Are there different considerations for people of different ethnicities? Yeah, toothpick blue and flat marker. Yeah, you have to be, um, ethnicities have to do more with uh, skin quality. So people who are dark complected. Okay, hold this one are much more prone to forming a noticeable scar than people who are lightly complected, 11. So one has to consider scar placement in certain ethnic groups um, because if somebody's prone to forming a noticeable scar, you want to put those incisions in the least noticeable area. Let's talk about liposuction, um, belly fat. Yeah. How much fat can you safely remove from someone? Like, what's is there a limit for sure. like? Well, the limit is determined by two things. How much can you remove with liposuction? Uh, theoretically, uh, one outpatient lipo procedure should yield about no more than five liters. Now, five liters is 10 pounds. That's a huge amount of fat to remove. It's very uncommon when we're tailoring fat with liposuction that you remove that kind of fat. Because liposuction is not a procedure for obesity. It's a procedure for contour improvement. Love handles, bulges in the hips, roll in the tummy, bulges in the inner, the outer thigh, saddlebags. And usually when you're removing fat from those areas, you may remove 200 cc's, half a pound, three or 400 cc's, three quarters, a pound, a pound. So the amount of fat that you remove is based on the patient's anatomy and the goal that can be achieved with that patient's anatomy. So again, it's not a weight loss operation, it's a sculpting operation. But from a pure safety point of view, about, about 5,000 cc's is kind of the max you would remove in an outpatient surgical setting for a liposuction procedure. What do people have to understand about liposuction? Meaning, you know, you remove Curves. X amount of fat. Does the fat, can it go back there if you don't? watch your diet or what happens? Mm -hmm. Does it go elsewhere? Well, you know, fat is, um, let me make a, <clears throat> simplistically speaking, you have a certain number of fat cells. So let me just sort of throw a number out. Say you have a thousand fat cells in your abdomen, your abdominal wall. When we do liposuction, we permanently remove some of those fat cells. We don't remove them all because you can't remove all the fat. And you're not there counting fat cells, 5-0. You're determining the result by lipo about how the contouring is, is happening while you're doing this. Now, say you, and this is just a, a I'm just throwing this number out, but say you remove 500, 500 fat cells and you still have 500 left. Well, those fat cells that are gone, they're gone forever. They're not coming back. But Fat has a memory as to what its duty in life is. And so the fat that's left, those 500 fat cells that left won't make new fat cells, but those fat cells that are left will grow. So if you gain weight, and word to the wise is maintain your diet and exercise regimen relatively stable if you're going to go to the trouble and expense of doing a liposuction procedure. But if you gain weight, some of those fat cells that are left will grow. And so you can get some recurrence of 
a bulge in an area where a bulge was removed. Liposuction can be repeated if need be as well. Where's the most common area you do it? Liposuction? Mm -hmm. um, abdomen, hips, what we call love handles or hips. Those are two most common areas. Third in women is the saddlebag area, the outer thigh. And of course, male breasts we talked about. We have a five volt plane, single, short. And then liposuction is also not just an operation. Sometimes it's a step of an operation. So liposuction in itself can be a procedure, but sometimes it's part of a procedure, it's a tool. For instance, today we use liposuction. The very first step of the operation was lipocontouring of the little fat pocket in Gloria's neck. So this is not a liposuction procedure, but we did one of the steps of this operation was to use liposuction. So liposuction sometimes is a procedure all by itself, or sometimes it's done in conjunction with other procedures. So when we do a tummy tuck, for instance, we will often use liposuction, lipocontouring, as part of that tummy tuck as a step in the operation. What's the most common surgery you do in particular? Right, what we're doing now. Facelifts? Yeah, probably the probably facelift eyelid surgery. They're, they're two of our very, very common procedures in my practice. Every plastic surgeon has different practice uh, parameters. Sometimes they're based on uh, bucket. In that bucket, Deb. Sometimes they're based on physician's interest. You know, for instance, there's some doctors that don't like to do facelifts. Some doctors don't like to do liposuction. Some doctors don't like to do breast implant surgery. So they'll tend to focus on another part of our, our specialty. Um, short 5-0. I like to do everything. 5-0 plane, is that plane? How much is a consultation, and is that um, added to the cost of surgery? Mm -hmm. uh, our consultation is $75, which is what we've charged since 1980. Never raised it. Um, it does not add to the cost of surgery. It's deducted. So if a patient has a surgical procedure, uh, that cost of that consultation is deducted there from that procedure. And that covers our cost to see patients. When, you know, when we see patients in consultation, besides my time, you know, we take pictures, we make a medical record, we give patients lots of colored brochures and so forth. So, you know, it's just really to cover our cost. Is this plain? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I'm take a five of Vicor next. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've never raised our consultation fee, and. Uh, I know that some people charge formidable amounts for consultation. The way I look at that is, too thick, though. Um, I want somebody to be able to, I want to have an opportunity to educate a patient. And you know, if you make the consultation fee too high, they're not given to come see you. So I think it has to be reasonable. Hold that forward. Here. Curves? Straight up. Did I go? Now you could have a nice dinner at a restaurant, or you could come for a cosmetic surgery consultation with Dr. Wetnowski. That's the one I would choose. <laughs> 
uh, and then five will plane next. So everything's going very well. We're down in our last tailoring stage here. We're going to put the skin sutures in next. A length plane. Have you ever done surgery at night? <laughs> Not by choice. <laughs> you know, once in a while, if you have a hematoma or an emergency or something like that, uh, you know, you have to take care of that when it happens. But in general, uh, doing an elective surgery, nighttime hours, you, you know, you really want to do these procedures when everybody is alert and awake and so forth. So, uh, so an elective cosmetic surgery operation at night. But say if a patient gets a hematoma and it's 11 o'clock at night, you know, you can't say call me in the morning. You know, you have to take care of it. All right, we have another viewer question. How old is too old for a uh, facelift, and would it help move your cheek gums from your teeth so you stop biting down on them? Uh, the latter, sometimes, sometimes if people have a lot of sagging, uh, that tissue kind of falls toward the center part of the face. And so sometimes when you lift away from that, that can sometimes help that. Um, the age at which people have a facial surgery is really not so much determined by chronological age, but by physiological age. So, you know, if a patient is in good health and they're older, then they certainly can undergo an elective procedure of this nature. Uh, sometimes the modif sometimes procedures are modified based on patient's age uh, for safety purposes, you know. But in general, that's determined on an individual basis. Like I said, based on the individual's uh, physiology, physiology. And a lot of it depends on their their health. Right? Sure, you know. Sometimes uh, older patients are in really good health, and their age is not an issue. Uh, but sometimes their health isn't so good, then the age can become a bit of an issue. Five o' plane. Mm -hmm. Is um, there anyone who's like not a candidate because they have like diabetes or high blood pressure or those types of things? Well, those things need to be taken into consideration and they need to be controlled. So a controlled hypertensive, a controlled diabetic t will, will tend to do okay with these surgeries but their medications need to be, their, their disease processes need to be controlled. And then when we're here in surgery with those patients, just as we do everybody, you know, we will monitor their blood pressure, their blood glucose, uh, and so forth. But it also depends on the severity of those patients. You know, if somebody's had hypertension and they've had multiple medical problems from their hypertension, heart attacks, strokes, you know, they may not be an ideal candidate to have an elective, elective cosmetic procedure. And that's why I said some of those people, that particular patient population, you know, they're sometimes a non-surgical candidate. At least we could do something. Are there risks with non-surgical -cos uh, non cosmetic procedures? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the non-surgical procedures are not without risk. Um, let's take the injections, Botox, filler, those kinds of things. Um, one of the reasons that a properly trained person doing those is important is because 
you know the anatomy. You know where the nerves are, where the blood vessels are. Uh, you can't just want willy-nilly do those injections without being aware of those blood supplies because there can be complications from those injections uh, not properly done. Same thing goes with the other non-surgical procedures, the skin tightening procedures, the skin contouring procedures. They also need to be properly done uh, and they have limitations too. And uh, so the skill set of the provider uh, is important. I would not go to a clinic in a shopping mall to have any of this done. Because most of those places, moist please, are without any kind of medical supervision, some kinds even without any kind of medical direction. We don't have too much of a problem with it in our city. With some, uh, in some parts of the country, Florida being one, um, some of the situations are. So back to the very beginning, be an educated consumer. Do your homework. Make sure this person is board certified in plastic surgery. Make sure their skill set is such. What kind of experience do they have? How long have they been in practice? What, what's your thought? We, we do have some medi spas around here. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts on people who might choose to go that route because it may be a little cheaper? Um, double hold, please. My, my, my answer is be careful about shopping for price with any of these procedures. Whether you're having a procedure in a doctor's office or a medi spa. Number one. Number two, many of these facilities have proper physician involvement and our supervision. Many don't. So I think homework needs to be done, you know, from that point of view. But um, I think buying any kind of a cosmetic procedure because of price is a huge mistake. You need to buy that procedure based on the place you're going, who's going to do the procedure, uh, experience of the person doing the procedure, and so forth. Well, that's true, too. Can you repeat what he just said? Yeah, Dr. Shaw said a lot of times they're not cheaper. And that is true, too. Sometimes they just, they're out there. <laughs> and that's a good point. How many procedures can a person have in one day? Uh, it depends on what they're, you know, what they're, uh, what they need. I mean, we often will do multiple procedures. Um, when we do facial surgery, sometimes we'll do a brow lift, eyelids, and a facelift at the same time. Sometimes we will do facial surgery and a breast operation or a tummy operation at the same time. Wouldn't a facelift do all that for you? Like, do you really need a brow lift and an eye lift if you're already no, getting a dif facelift? Different department. Oh. Yeah, the, the lower part of the face, okay, go down. The lower part of the face starts where your cheekbones are and goes down to your collarbone, which is what we tackled today. But the eyelids, upper and lower eyelids, and the forehead or brow, or the upper third of the face. Uh, people may not need anything done to those, uh, but uh, sometimes they do. And often we will combine those procedures in one procedure. So the number of procedures that one person does in a day is dictated, again, medical condition, anatomy, and it's customized. But it is not uncommon to do more than one procedure at one time on a selected basis. Do you do any surgeries that don't require anesthesia that are just uh, local? Okay. 
Once in a while, we do a local procedure, or sometimes we'll do a procedure with sedation anesthesia. But those are usually pretty minor procedures. Um, this particular procedure, for example, uh, imagine as a patient trying to lay still for four hours while somebody's doing very delicate dissection and knitting and, and stitching. Um, patients start to squirm, they become uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes the local anesthesia wears off. So sometimes when you get to a certain length procedure, uh, uh, anesthesia is the only way to go. Now, smaller procedures, sometimes we can do under local anesthesia. But uh, really, the, our procedures are often more extensive than a smaller procedure, but customized to the patient as well. And sometimes we don't use a general anesthesia. Sometimes we'll do what they call MAC anesthesia, which is twilight sleep type anesthesia. So that's in between being wide awake and being totally asleep. Another 5 0 play. Mm -hmm. Nice. Home stretch. So, yeah, we're coming up on the four hour mark, too. It probably took us a little longer today because we talked. Uh, normally when I operate, uh, there's no conversation at all, as the, ta the staff can attest to. Um, so that may take a little time, but maybe not. I think we've moved along pretty, nothing's really slowed us down here. So once we're done, we're going to put a bandage on. And then after the bandage is put on, Dr. Shaw is going to wake Gloria up, and then she'll go to the recovery area. And you'll see she'll wake right up. She'll be groggy, but they wake up pretty fast. I also think, uh, you know, I hope for those people who watch this, you know, sometimes if people aren't used to watching surgery, it's a little off-putting. But I also think if, if people watch this, even for a few minutes here and there, they will see that this is very precise, tidy, tailored, step-at-a-time surgery. This is not bang, bang, bang. And uh, the other thing is, in terms of results in bruising and swelling, how the tissues are handled during surgery by the surgeon makes a difference. And uh, so when I say to people, hold this here, 
you're not buying a Ford. You know, wherever you buy your Ford, it's the same Ford. Get the best deal. When you're buying surgery, you're not buying a facelift. You're buying an experience. And you're buying that experience, part of which includes the skill set of the surgeon. The more experienced surgeon, and we have a lot of really good, excellent, experienced plastic surgeons in Cleveland. We're very lucky that way. Uh, the better the skill set, sloppy, the better the patient's going to do. Now, if you look at her, she has almost no bruising um, at this point. She'll develop some. Change size. I don't know if anybody's looking at her, but I am. <laughs> All right, we're going to put her head straight up. Dr. Shaw, raise the table, please. Little How floor. is mammogram performed with breast implants? Is it dangerous to have them squished? Okay, that's good. Uh, what was the question? How are mammograms performed with breast implants? Is it dangerous to have them squished? Well, mammograms have to, when you, go, when you have a breast implant and you are going to have a mammogram, you need to make sure that the mammogram, the mammographer knows that you have breast implants in. That's number one. Uh, number two, then they take that into account. And uh, you know, most of the time, routine mammography can be performed with breast implants. But there are certain kinds of situations with implants that require different kind of breast evaluation. For instance, if somebody has breast implants and they have some uh, what we call capsular contracture, where they have some hard scarring that's formed around the implant, that can sometimes make a mammogram difficult to do. And sometimes those patients are better off <laughs> with an ultrasound or an MRI. Raise the table a little bit more, Dr. Shaw. OK, that's good. All right, let's get this dressing on. This yellow gauze is just a antibacterial gauze that we use <clears throat> around the incisions. So it has two, two goals. One, it's antibacterial, and it's a non-sticky gauze. Take the drape up. Just the, just the top layer, just the top layer. No, no, just, just, the, just the tape. Oh, here. Okay. Um, so that the gauzes don't stick to the bandage. So for those of you who are watching, um, Dr. Wotnowski is just finishing up Gloria's uh, neck lift and lower face lift. Uh, Dr. Shaw then will bring her out of anesthesia. They're obviously wrapping up and um, literally putting bandages on her face. She'll go into recovery for about 90 minutes, uh, and then she'll obviously get a ride home from her husband. Um, we'll take her home, and then he'll be watching over her for the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, she'll come back tomorrow to see Dr. Witnowski so he can take a look and make sure everything is, is healing well and going well. Um, and uh, Gloria is going to be sending me weekly updates. So she'll send me pictures of herself, um, mm. you know, post-surgery each towel. week. You'll be able to take a look and see how she's doing. Yeah, and uh, we'll have those down. before and afters up on WKYC.com and you know I'll be sure to tweet them out or put them on my Facebook page too so for those of you who are interested you can watch and uh, remember if um, if you if you missed it or you didn't get to see all of this uh, and you want to see certain parts and pieces of it it will be on our YouTube uh, page at WKYC YouTube page just look for uh, live in the OR watch a full facelift um, You'll be able to click on that and, and watch. Unfortunately, obviously, it'll be recorded, but um, Dr. Witnowski has graciously um, said that uh, we'll be doing another live surgery, and I'll be doing a few more of these, um, uh, more from the medical base point of those. We're working out getting some procedures to be live in the OR. So you can see these things. Maybe it's something you actually need to have done um, and we're going to take you inside the OR so you can see it being done and you can have your <clears throat> questions answered.
Give me some BSS. Dr. Shaw, you can wake her up. Okay. Pickups for the. Uh, Am I still on the mic? Yes, you are. Okay. Everybody, thank you very much. You guys did a great job. Thank you to the camera crew, Monica, who I've known a long time, which is wonderful. We appreciate it. Thank you to the staff for allowing us to be in your space. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to, uh, we're just about to um, finish up and put uh, Gloria into the recovery room, and that's when we're going to um, end our stream. There you go. Thank you. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Witnowski. Again, if you have any other questions, what's the number to the office? 440-808-9315. Uh, All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. This is going to end our WKYC stream. Are we off? Don't wait the